Kia ora koto, and welcome to Abyss in about three minutes. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a reasonably simple game. Who lives in a citadel under the sea? Scheming and vicious and nasty are thee. If nautical intrigue be something you wish, then crush your foes, become lord of the fish. The game ends after one player has recruited seven lords. The winner is the player with the most points, and you get these from lords, locations, supporters, and monster tokens. Set collection. Minions come in five colors, valued one to five. Push your luck. Exploring the depths carries risks and rewards. Player turn. Pearls are the currency in this game. At the start of your turn, you can spend one pearl to add a new lord to the display. You then choose one of three actions. The first is to explore. Turn over a card, then in seating order, players can purchase it. If they all pass, you can take it and then end your turn. The first card here is ignored by all players. The second one is purchased for one pearl. Repeat this process with each card being purchased costing one more pearl. If you reach the end of the row, you must take that card and collect a pearl. All remaining cards are placed in piles and turned over. If you draw a monster card while exploring, you can end your turn and claim the reward here, or continue and move the marker down one step. The second action is to claim one of the piles of cards in the middle. Take all of them to your hand. The third action is to buy one lord using cards. This lord costs 10 and they must all be purple. Take the lord and then move the others to close the gap. This lord also costs 10 but must include green cards and at least one other colour. And finally, this lord also costs 10 but needs all 5 colours. You can spend pearls one for one when buying cards as well. If the lord you purchase leaves this spot open, claim two pearls and then refill the row. Keep the lowest value card you use to recruit the lord. It is worth points at the end of the game. Some lords also grant powers when purchased or ongoing abilities. When you have three keys, either from lords or monster hunting, you must take a location. Take either a face up one or draw one to four and pick leaving the others face up for the other players. The location you picked goes over your lord's special abilities, negating them. Why would you like this game? Abyss takes what could have been a very normal set collection game and makes it into something quite special, mostly because of its wonderful theme and great art. Undersea monster politics as a game theme is not overused, and the lord cards in particular bring out the theme and are just stunning. Gameplay wise, it's solid enough with pretty easy to learn rules and just enough happening in the power combinations of lords and locations to keep most gamer minds busy throughout the game. The best thing about this game is the satisfying clunk of pearls falling in your cup when people buy cards off you. It's so damn good. However, the victory point system in the game can trip up a few players and how supporters work isn't immediately intuitive. And the game definitely works better with four players. Also, the constant asking of players if they want to buy a card during exploration can slow some groups down a lot. For a simpler set collection game, try Splendor. And for something a bit more complex, consider Museum. Abyss, a monstrous good time. If you enjoyed this video, hit the notification button, subscribe to the channel, and come support us on Patreon. Kia ora koto and welcome to Aeon's End in about 3 minutes. It has a solo mode, and it's a game for 1-4 to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty simple game. Down in the depths, the underground city of Gravehold waits for the inevitable attack to come. Otherworldly entities threaten the city, and the only line of defense are the mages who tap into the very extra dimensional power that threatens to destroy them. Can you hold the line in the darkness against the oncoming monstrosities? You all win if you manage to reduce your enemy's health to zero. You lose if the health of the city is reduced to zero, or if your character's health is zero. Deck building. You start the game with a standard deck of cards and improve it throughout the game. Player turn. Each player takes one of the available characters and forms their starting deck. Then select your nemesis for this game. Select nine sets of cards for the shared market. This will be four sets of spells, two relics, and three gems. You can choose randomly or pick which combinations to use. Gems provide ether, which is the core currency in this game. Relics are used to boost other effects, and we'll talk about spells later. You'll also need the turn order deck. It has two cards for the nemesis, and has four player cards. Shuffle and deal those. If it is a player card, it is their turn. Your player area has the following information. Your draw pile, hand of cards, discard pile, 
charges tracker, unique special ability, character health, player number, and breaches. Normally you would cast spells at the start of your turn, but let's cover other actions first. Most actions cost ether, and you get those mainly from gems. These four gems total to four ether, so we play them to our discard. We buy this four cost card from the market and place it in our discard pile. We then cast a spell into an open breach for later use. Two ether can be spent to gain a charge, and when you are fully charged, you can spend all five tokens to use your special ability. You can also rotate and open breaches. The rotate cost is here and allows you to turn the breach clockwise one step. The open cost is here and allows you to flip it straight to open. Spells in an open breach can stay there indefinitely. Spells in an unopened breach must be cast at the start of your next turn. If the spell does damage to the nemesis, adjust their health accordingly. Then draw up to five cards. Note, unlike most games, you do not shuffle your deck when it recycles. Just take it and turn it over. So the first card you played into your discard is now on top of the deck. If it is the nemesis turn, they play a card, which is either a minion that will attack until it is defeated, an instant attack, or a power that can be cancelled before it activates. Each nemesis also has its own special rules. Why would you like this game? Aeon's End is an incredibly tightly designed, cooperative deck building game that really shines for two players. There's a wide selection of different cards and playstyles you can try, and each player can specialize in what they do. The player powers are focused on helping allies, which makes the game feel really collegial. And the different villains you fight in the game also have their own fun and unique mechanics, and each represents a different challenge. And the pacing of the game is dramatic. As the nemesis hits harder, you get better. You start off doing one damage a turn, but can end up doing lots more later in the game. The best thing about this game is the no shuffle mechanic it allows you to build combos far more effectively than relying on the luck of the draw however at four players the game drags and at three players it has this weird wild card mechanic which is just an awkward system as good as it is solo and with two players i just can't recommend it at three or four and I had some issues with component quality. All of my nemesis and player boards came warped and the dials are loose and wobbly. And that annoyed me so much that I got third party replacements. For a more complex co-op card game, try Sentinels of the Multiverse. And for a different theme, try Legendary Encounters Alien. Aeon's End, two's a date, three's a crowd. Kia Koto and welcome to Blitz Bowl in about three minutes. Review copy used. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two players. Playing time is short and it's a pretty simple game. Hello Blood Bowl fans, time for a quick game of Blitz Bowl, the fastest version of your favourite game, Blood Bowl. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Bob Bifford. Bob, your thoughts on Blitz Bowl? I don't know, Jim. The game is quicker for sure. But I don't like how you can't have a good old-fashioned nine-on-one pile-on. That's a good point, Bob. Let's head down to the field of play. The winner is the coach of the team with the most points once the challenge cards run out. You get points for scoring touchdowns and completing challenges. Variable player powers. Each team and each player has its own strengths and weaknesses. Dice. Actions in Blitz Bowl use dice. Player turn. Each player takes a dugout, their set of dice, and their team's player cards. Some cards will represent multiple players. Place your team in your own end zone. Each turn you will have three actions, and you can have one player take multiple actions, as long as each action is different. Move allows you to move a number of spaces as shown here. If you move onto the ball, you can pick it up, but you cannot move adjacent to an opponent. The mark action allows you to move two spaces, but you must end your turn adjacent to an opponent. The block action lets you hit an adjacent player, roll one die, and check the result. You want knockdowns and crunches. If you have two players adjacent to the opponent, roll two dice and pick. If a player is knocked down, they must make an armor save. If successful, they stay knocked down, but can take a stand-up action later. If not, they are removed from the field to your dugout. Players in the dugout may take a reserve action to move to your end zone. The throw action allows you to move the ball quickly. Roll over the throwing player's throw score, but reduce your roll by one for long range and any opponents in the way. On a failed throw or a knockdown of the ball carrier, scatter the ball using a D8. Marked players cannot pick up the ball, so keep rolling until it lands clear or on an unmarked player. Moving the ball to the end zone scores you three points. Place a scoring player in your dugout and launch a new ball into play. In addition, each turn there will be three available challenge cards to claim. For example, Showboat for the Crowd gives you an extra point if you scored a touchdown on your turn. Each card also gives you a bonus play you can use later in the game. If you didn't claim a challenge card on your turn, discard one and refresh the line. Play until the challenge cards run out. Why would you like this game? 
Obviously, Blitz Bowl is a reimagining of the classic Blood Bowl, but despite having the same theme, they are incredibly different games. Blood Bowl is a risk management game where every failure is punished harshly. Blitz Bowl, on the other hand, is far more forgiving and actively encourages you to do different things with the challenge cards. The three actions per player keep the turn short, and it's an ultra fast paced two player game as a result. And while the game comes with all you need to play it, it also ships with the rules for most of the other teams in the Blood Bowl setting. So you can play it with other figures if you have them, like my 25 year old team here. The best thing about this game is the challenge cards. They not only give you points, but allow you to make interesting bonus plays. However, Blitz Bowl has limited availability worldwide, which is annoying as it's probably the most accessible and fun Games Workshop game I've played in years. And if you're looking for a deep serious game, this isn't it. It's a turbocharged, silly football game. As mentioned, this game is a fast version of Blood Bowl. And for a different type of sport, try rugby the game. Blitz Bowl. It's basically Rugby Sevens. If you Kia ora koutou and welcome to Brass Birmingham in about three minutes. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two to four players, playing time is long, and it's a pretty complex game. It's the Industrial Revolution in Northern England. You are an early capitalist hoping to build a mighty business and reap huge profits. Can you become one of the great British captains of industry? The game ends after two eras of play. An era lasts until all cards have been played. The winner is the player with the most points at the end of the game, and you get these by placing links and selling buildings. Card manager. Every action in brass requires cards. Network building. Connecting your network is the key to victory. Player turn. You will have a hand of eight cards and can take two actions each turn. Each action requires you to use a card. You then redraw to eight cards unless the deck is empty, in which case you play until your hand runs out and the error ends. You can spend an action to place a link. In error one, this costs three coins, and in error two, it costs five coins and a coal to place one link, or 15 coins, two coal, and a bear to place two. You can construct a building if it is connected by links using the matching industry card, or you can build anywhere if you have the matching city card. You must build the lowest tier building in a group first. You can sell a building if you are connected to a matching merchant. Selling requires you to spend bear, either your own from anywhere or another player's if you are connected to them. Selling flips buildings and grants you increased income and victory points. Resource buildings also flip if all the resources are used. You can use another player's links to sell a building and bear on a merchant if it is still available. If you build a coal mine and is connected to a merchant and the coal market has space, that coal automatically sells to the market and you can flip the building. Iron mines do the same but don't need to be connected. The develop action allows you to spend iron to remove buildings from your board so you can build higher tier ones earlier. When your income goes up, move it by the number of small steps shown. You can take an action to get a loan for 30 coins, but that takes your income down three full steps. Finally, you can discard three cards to draw one of each wild card. These count as any location or any industry type. Place all money spent on your two actions here. The next turn's turn order is based on who spent the least money. At the end of era one, remove all links and tier one buildings. This may leave you with very little on the board for era two. Why would you like this game? Brass Birmingham is a pretty heavyweight game that would appeal to people who like a good amount of player interaction and and thinking on their feet. And it's the opportunism that makes brass really tick. You see the iron market is getting empty, so you can make a quick buck by placing one. There's also different ways to score points. You can get plenty from selling buildings, but just as many, if not more, from well-placed links. And the markets change each game, shifting how the board evolves. What is hot one game will not be the next. The best thing about this game is that you want other players using your stuff. So take this turn. The gray player uses an iron to place a coal mine and then sells their factory. Yellow, red, and gray all gain from this. However, in groups with players with analysis paralysis, it can grind to a crawl. So if you are a slow player, make sure to play with people who don't mind that. Setup is also a bit of a pain, getting all those buildings in place. And the coins from the basic game are annoying. Play with either chips from the deluxe version or get a cheap box of poker chips. Brass Birmingham is a reimagining of Brass Lancashire, and the games share a lot in common. And for another classic network builder, try Power Grid. Brass Birmingham. How about Gold Medal Birmingham? Kia ora koutou and welcome to Britannia in about three minutes. Review copy used. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two to four players, but works best at four. Playing time is long, and it's a reasonably complex game. It's 43 AD, and the Roman legions are getting ready to invade Britain. 
This will be the first major invasion, but it will not be the last. Wave after wave of invaders, Danes, Angles, Saxons, Normans and more will come and will become part of British history. The game ends after 16 eras of play. The winner is the player with the most points at this time. Victory points. Each of the 17 different factions has different ways of scoring. Area control. You must hold areas on the map to score points and get new forces. Dice. Combat in Britannia is resolved with dice. Player turn. While there are four players, each will control multiple of the 17 different factions in the game over time. They activate in the following order, starting with the Romans and ending with the Normans. Check the current turn in your faction to see if any new units turn up and what special rules impact you this turn. Then gain reinforcements, based on the regions you control. Green regions worth two points and others one, meaning the red player here gets 10 reinforcement points. For every six points, add a new unit into an area you control, and then place a marker to show the remainder. This remainder will be added to your reinforcement point total next turn. Each unit may activate once and move up to two regions. You must stop your movement if you enter rough terrain such as mountains. Some turns you will have invaders who start at sea. They will often have boats which allow them to move to a sea region before moving on land. If they are also raiders, place a raiding marker. This means they can return to the ocean at the end of the turn. Combat is next. Normally each unit rolls one die and eliminates an opponent on a five or a six. In rough terrain, attackers are hit normally, but defenders are only hit on a six. Starting with the defender, you may choose to retreat or continue fighting, rolling dice again. Some turns are major invasions, in which case each invader can activate twice, moving and attacking again. The Romans break most of the rules mentioned above, moving faster, hitting on fours and only being eliminated on sixes. Leaders will sometimes spawn, like Boudicca here. They allow armies to move further and also roll dice in combat. There are lots of other special rules, including handling how some factions surrender to others and the removal of the Roman legions and their replacement by the Romano-British culture. Finally, at the end of each turn, score whatever points are applicable for that round. Why would you like this game? If you have an interest in the history of the invasions of Britain from 43 AD to 1066 AD, this is the game for you. The game ebbs and flows in a unique way, starting off with the dramatic Roman invasion, which is an excellent opening set piece to a game. The core combat and movement rules are simple and straightforward, with the complications being the unique scoring for each faction and the timings of invasions and raiders. The player's aides do an excellent job of presenting all this information in a four page handout as well. But this is a game foremost for people who want to recreate British history. The best thing about this game is the quality of the new edition. The board, minis, and player aids are excellent. However, Britannia adheres quite rigidly to its view of history. This note in the rulebook explains the inherent scripting in the game. Not only are the invasions timed the same way each game, the scoring system is incredibly detailed and restrictive. The Jutes will always hit Kent because they score more points for Kent than anywhere else. So while Britannia retells British history, that's also its weakness. There is no alternative future where the Scots leave Scotland. If the ideas of cultures rising and falling appeals to you, consider Small World. And for a more in-depth historic game about Britain, try Pendragon. Britannia. New edition, old game. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Catacombs Cubes in about three minutes, review copy used. It has a solo mode, it's a game for one to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty simple game. In Catacombs Cubes you are the builders of the town of Stormtrine, trying to build the most prestigious and outlandish buildings in the growing township. Can you master Tetris-like skills and build the most impressive buildings? The game ends once a pre-established number of buildings have been built, 12 or 16. The winner is the player with the most points, which you normally get from placing these buildings. Dice. Resources each turn are determined by dice rolls. Cube placement. Each building card requires you to build it out of blocks. Player turn. Each turn one player is the master builder and rolls the resource dice. They can then swap one pair of dice in the resource tray. The blocks in this game are called resources and come in many different shapes. Each player then has two main options. Take a pair of resource dice or build a building. If you take the resource dice, Find the matching resources and then place them on your character board. There are always four buildings available to build on the main display. We select the infirmary because we can build it with the resources obtained on our previous turn. We score the points shown on the tile and then place it in the village. At each tile corner there is a coloured arrow, each of which grants a different bonus. If the arrows are different you may choose either reward. If they match you get double rewards. Each player also has a personal residence, which is a unique building only they may construct. When that is built, place your player marker on top of it. Note, all buildings must be built freestanding. If someone places a tile beside your residence, you may add a free resource to your board. When you build a building, all resources in your construction yard, except for the small black obsidian cubes, are discarded. 
you keep resources in your warehouse. The green side of the die can be used to add resources to your board, but the grey reward marker lets you add one to your warehouse. Finally, you can also build a palace using either the red side of the die or a red token. Gain points on the palace track based on the size of the resource you added, and then claim the points and resources shown. Play until the city is complete. Why would you like this game? Catacombs Cubes is a fun city building game with simple rules and tactile gameplay. It's pleasant to look at with a wholesome presentation style and artwork that makes it welcoming to all ages. The core decision points are straightforward, draft or build. And the fact even unused resources are removed when you build something means you have to plan out your decisions in advance. Catacombs Cubes will reward people who enjoy visualizing a puzzle and then building it. The mini games within Catacombs Cubes are also interesting, including how the buildings are placed within the township and the palace construction mini game. The best thing about this game is the process of making the buildings. Playing with blocks is just fun. However, this game ships with two ways of selecting resources. We only use the dice system, and I'm not sure why the game needs both. It adds a little bit of confusion learning the rules as well. And the building tiles don't look like they form a city. They just sit in open fields, and I think that's a missed opportunity. For a more tense but less tactile game, try Tiny Towns. And for more building stuff, try Junk Art. Catacombs Cubes. No catacombs to be seen. Plenty of cubes though. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Chess in about three minutes. Chess is an ancient game, but the version that is played today took shape in the 15th century and finally had its rules formally codified in the 19th century. Chess is played all over the world, a truly global game with a fan base of millions. Its rules are reasonably simple, but its strategies are not. Two players will take command of their pieces and alternate moving them around the board, capturing and removing their opponent's pieces while safeguarding their own. Can you master the game of kings, or will you lose it all on turn 4 in a fool's mate? The game ends once one player's king is removed from the board, or any player resigns because they believe they cannot win. A game can occasionally end in a draw where neither player can win. Player turn. Each player controls 16 pieces. The king, which must be defended at all costs. The queen, two bishops, two knights, two rooks, and eight pawns. The setup is always the same. White always takes the first move and players alternate turns until the game ends. If the piece moves into a space occupied by an opponent's piece, that piece is removed from the board. Each piece type has its own movement and capture rules. And unless otherwise noted, a piece cannot move through other pieces. Pawns may only move forward one space, or for their very first move, they may move forward two spaces. Pawns may capture a piece by moving diagonally one square. If a pawn makes a double move and ends up adjacent to an opponent's pawn, the opponent's pawn may move diagonally behind it on the next turn to capture it. Rooks may move in straight lines any number of places. Knights move in an L shape and can leap over other pieces. They capture pieces they land on. Here are all the valid movement spots for this white knight. The L shape is two squares one direction and then either left or right one more. Bishops move on the diagonals and can move any distance capturing pieces they move into. The king can only move and capture one square but in any direction. The final piece is the queen, who combines the movement and capturing of a bishop and a rook. If your king and a rook are in their starting positions, and there are no pieces between them, you can do a special move called castling. This moves both pieces to be adjacent to each other. You can do this on either side as well. If a pawn makes it to your opponent's back line, they can be upgraded to a different piece type. Normally this is a queen, and you can do this even if you still have your queen in play, using a proxy piece instead. When a piece is in position to capture the king, that is called check. On the next turn, you must either move the king out of check, block the move, or capture the piece that has the king in check. The king may never move itself into check. If a move places a king in check, and there are no valid moves to make, that is checkmate, and the end of the game. The king cannot move into its own pawns. This space is threatened by this pawn, it cannot stay in this row because of the rook, nor move to this one because of the other rook. Therefore, this game is a win to the black player. Why would you like this game? Chess is one of the most popular board games in the world and has been for centuries. And that's because while the rules of chess are comparatively simple, the depth of its strategies are vast. Playing chess at a high level requires the ability to think many turns ahead to calculate possible opponent moves and how to counter them. And while this can appear to be a special math puzzle, there is an art to the strategy as well. Do you play aggressively, trading pieces and hoping to dominate the end game? Do you tease the sacrifice of a valuable piece, knowing it will open up the board for you? But what makes chess such a hit is that the game also works well for new players, and discovering chess and how it works is a journey millions of people have been on. 
The best thing about this game is that you can play anyone, anywhere. There is no language barrier, it really is a global game. However, chess is best played with people of comparable skill levels. The gap between expert play and novice play is massive, and there is zero luck in chess. Chess will frequently be compared to Go, another beloved classic game. And for a modern game with chess-like sensibilities, try Santorini. Chess, the game, not the musical. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Cloud Spire in about three minutes. Review copy used. There is a solo mode complete with a solo scenario book. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty complex game. They who control the source controls Ankar, a realm of floating land masses and warring factions. Can you master the terrain, harness the source, maneuver your forces and build a mighty defensive fortress? Or will the enemy smash your gates and ruin you? Cloud Spy has solo, co-op and competitive modes of play, but generally you win if you smash your opponent's fortress gates while keeping yours protected. Action programming. Many units in Cloud Spire move along pre-planned paths. Asymmetry. Each faction has totally different units and fortress upgrades. Player turn. Each player has a fortress board which shows their upgrades as well as a reference sheet along with a stack of different units they can deploy. Units are double sided and have health, damage, speed, recruit cost, rewards for defeating them and special abilities. There are also range, damage and defense upgrade tokens that can be added to some units. Units come in three types. Heroes who move independently, units who move on pre-programmed paths, and spires that don't move at all. The round starts with an event card being drawn and played. Then each player gains source. On turn one this is five, but by turn four it is 11. Source is used in the market phase to buy terrain tiles or mercenaries, and in the build phase to upgrade your fortress. The cost for each upgrade is shown on your reference card. Pay the cost and place a pin in the board to show the upgrade. You can also build spires on source wells you control, including the ones in your base. Next you recruit using command points which is the same base number as source you just gained. Here we have a zero cost hero and five points of units and we add health markers under each of them. We can choose to stack one unit under another to protect it like so. Once that's done we place our ready units on the gate and then nominate which opponent we are moving towards. Units will move their speed down the path to your target. If they come within range of an enemy spire it can attack, rolling a number of dice equal to its attack tokens. For each hit remove one health from a unit. If you are beside an exploration marker you can choose to look at it. This may lead to a fight but once the token is removed you may be able to build a spire on that spot. Next comes your combat. Our unit has three range so it could attack the grey unit for one damage or the spire removing its bottom token. On your opponent's turn their units advance and attack doing enough damage to remove the top unit. This gives them a reward of source but also reveals the protected unit on full health which was the plan as this incorporeal unit can move through your opponents and they can't turn to fight. Hero units can move any way they want, but note that terrain has an impact on where you can move. Why would you like this game? Let's get the obvious out of the way first. Cloud Spire is not a cheap game, but its production values are through the roof. In particular, the poker chips are weighty and feel wonderful to play with. Cloud Spire is for people who want an intensely competitive and mentally challenging chess match of a game. The mixture of pre-planning your turn, but being able to react with your heroes gives Cloud Spire a unique decision space. I also like that you can manipulate the board and board positioning of spires and tiles is a huge part of winning the game. The best thing about this game is the asymmetry is off the charts. Each faction doesn't feel a little different, they have totally different toolkits, powers and playstyles. However, while the core gameplay isn't too complex, the number of exceptions and special rules are a handful. It's hard to remember what your own unit skills are, let alone your opponents. The learning curve is steep. Like the idea of defending against swarms of attackers? Try Dawn of the Zeds. And want something a lot simpler? Try The Captain is Dead, Dangerous Planet. Cloud Spire. I now know what a MOBA is. Karakoto and welcome to Concordia in about three minutes. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two to five players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. You are the owner of a Roman trading house, hoping to extend your reach across the empire. You will make contracts with powerful personalities, build markets and production facilities from Egypt to Britannia and trade goods all over the empire. But ultimately, it is not wealth that will determine whose trading empire is the greatest. It will be your devotion and sacrifice to the various Roman gods. The game ends when one player has built their 15th house or a player has purchased the last two personality cards. The winner is the player with the most points. Victory points. There are six different ways to score points. Card management. You play a card each turn to take actions. 
and they also impact on how you score at the end of the game. Network building. Concordia is all about building networks. Player turn. Each player starts with two colonists at Rome. They also have a storehouse that contains four colonists, two food, and one of each other type of resource. You start the game with a hand of seven cards. Each turn you will play one card and take the action on it. The Tribune card allows you to take played cards back into your hand. The Architect allows you to move your colonists a number of spaces equal to the number of colonists you control. We have two, so that is two spaces. We can move the land and sea colonists one space each, or the sea colonists two spaces. Only one colonist may be on any path. You may then build houses at any city your colonists are adjacent to. This costs the amount shown on this reference card. To build a house where someone already has one, costs more money. The prefect allows you to select a region to produce. Each player gets resources based on what tile their houses are on. The selecting player gains the region's bonus as well. In this case, green gets extra tools. Alternatively, you can gain coins by flipping all the markers back over to their ready side. The colonist card allows you to spend one food and tools to place new colonists in your cities. The Mercator lets you collect money and then buy and sell up to two types of goods. Goods values are shown on the storehouse. We sell three cloth for 21 coins to buy four wine for 24 coins. The Diplomat lets you play the top card of any player's discard pile. For most of the game, there are seven cards to buy on the board. You can use the Senator card to buy up to two of these, paying the cost on the card as well as the additional costs shown on the board. The Console card allows you to buy one card, but you ignore the additional costs shown on the board. Finally, there are Specialist cards which produce goods at houses of the same type. Keep playing until houses or cards run out. Why would you like this game? Concordia is a game with simple rules and engaging gameplay, with a complex and detailed scoring system that requires a lot of planning and thinking. Because the six scoring events are modified by how many cards you have of that event, knowing what cards to purchase and what they are worth at the end of the game is huge. But you also have to make use of them throughout the game. This means you have to plan out where you are going and what regions you want to spread to. It's definitely a game for people who like to start a game with a plan and see how well they can execute it. The best thing about this game is the prefix system. I love how it rewards you for producing in regions other people are in. It's just simple and elegant. However, the scoring system in Concordia is not immediately intuitive. It also takes a while to score the game once it ends. This can lead to a weird feeling where the end of the game is the least enjoyable part. One would assume a game about trading would focus on the accumulation of money. In Concordia, that is simply not the case, and it trips up new players. For another game about network building, try Power Grid. Or alternatively, Brass Birmingham. Concordia, the best trading in the Mediterranean game. Gold medal. Kia Koto and welcome to Dale of Merchant, Collector's Edition, in about three minutes. Review copy used. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two to four players. Playing time is short for two players and medium for three or four. It's a moderately complex game. In Dale of Merchants, you take the role of an animal folk merchant, trying to build the best and most wonderful trade stall possible. Can you manage your stock, use clever techniques, and outmaneuver your opponents? Or will you be forced to say, some might call this junk, but I call it treasure. The the winner is the first player to complete eight stalls. Stalls are sets of cards and increasing values in matching sets. Deck building. You start the game with a basic set of cards and add new ones throughout the game. Set collection. Sets of cards are not only used for scoring, they also have synergies with others of their type. Player turn. At the start of the game, select the animal sets you will play with. This is the number of players plus one. You start with a basic card from each set and a number of junk cards totaling to ten. On your turn, deal yourself five cards. Cards come in two main types, junk cards and animal cards. Each card has a value, the set it belongs to, its type and any special rules. On your turn, you can do one of the following four actions. Buy from the market. To buy a card, you must discard card values equal to its cost. For example, three here. Place the purchase card in your discard pile along with the cards you used. Note that cards further left have an increased cost to purchase and that some cards generate coins, which can also be used to buy things. The second action is to discard Discard any number of cards from your hand. This is because at the end of the turn, you only refill to five and cannot normally discard. The third action is to build your stall. We already have built a size one stall with this green card, so can build a size two stall alongside it. In later turns, we would need to build a size three stall. This can be done with one or multiple matching cards. The last action is technique, and this is when you play a card for its special ability. And this is where Dale of Merchants gets tricky, as many technique cards have this plus symbol, which means you can play another action 
afterwards, including another technique. So we play this card to search our discard for another card and put it at the bottom of our nearly empty deck. We then play this card to permanently remove a junk card. And then this one to draw two cards, paying one card to do so and discarding one. So we can get the card we got from our discard earlier and end the turn by taking a stall action with it. You can also play with variable player powers and other options, which add a significant variation on how you play. Why would you like this game? If that example of what you can do on your turn made you think, oh wow, that sounds cool, then this is a game for you. Dale of Merchants is a deck building game for fans of that core mechanic. If you've played out Dominion and want the next step up, this is your game. As the variety in the sets is huge, especially if you include all of the expansions for this game. And the variable player power options are utterly overwhelming in their variety and how they change gameplay. If the core gameplay does speak to you, then Dale of Merchants could give you hundreds, if not thousands of plays. The best thing about this game is its customization and variety. Oh, and the backstories of the characters, like this guinea pig safety tester, bless. However, to get all the stuff for Dale of Merchants means getting a fair few other boxes of stuff to complete the game. And despite the cute animals, this is a mechanics driven game and it lives and dies on its mechanics. If that turn sequence I described earlier sounds messy and finicky, this won't be for you and no amount of cute creatures changes that. As mentioned, this is an evolution of the mechanics introduced in Dominion. And like the cute animals but not the mechanics, consider Everdell. Dale of Merchants, systematic Eurasian beavers sold separately. Kia ora koutou and welcome to The Captain Is Dead Dangerous Planet in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. The game has a solo mode. It's a game for 1-7 to seven players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. The ship has crash landed on an unknown planet. And wouldn't you know it, the captain is dead. You don't have the means to repair the ship, but one of the crew finds an alien artifact and thinks it holds the key to your escape. There are tunnels nearby and some ominous skittering sounds. Can you repair the ship and escape before you are overrun? You all win this game if you secure enough artifacts based on the game's difficulty. You lose if too many artifacts are destroyed, the ship gets too badly damaged, and a few other ways. Card management. Many actions in this game require cards, and having the right ones is really important. Variable player powers. Each member of the crew brings different strengths to the group. Player turn. Each player selects a member of the crew to play as. Each crew member has different traits, such as your place in the turn order, how many actions you get, a special ability, and how many cards you can hold. Cards come in five types. The first four represent primary skills, and the last type are wild cards that count as any skill. Most characters have skill discounts, which act like permanent cards. Each player also gets a tool card at random. There are two main places in the game, the shuttle and the tunnels. The shuttle has a number of action spaces that you can use when they are online. For example, the comm system allows you to trade cards. If the system is offline, you'll have to repair it to use it. This repair costs one action and two tactical skills. But remember that skill discounts apply here, so the hacker only needs to play one card. In the tunnels, tiles are either revealed or unrevealed. When you move onto a tile, reveal it by flipping it over and following the instructions. You can claim artifacts by spending science cards for each one you claim. Claimed artifacts go on the victory track. Some spaces on that track will allow you to gain powerful relics, while others will increase the ferocity of the bugs. You can spend an action to move up to two spaces, and an action to remove a bug from your space. If the teleporter is active, you can move to any revealed space. You can place devices in your current location by paying their cost. Once you have used your actions, devices will activate. This zapper kills the three nearest bugs. Then draw an alert card and follow its instructions. Bugs then advance, attacking anything in their path, potentially wounding crew members and destroying devices. You can also cancel an alert card on your turn by playing three command cards. It's now the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? If you're looking for an affordable cooperative game where the tension constantly escalates throughout, you might like Dangerous Planet. That steadily increasing threat leads to some genuine tension throughout the game, and my plays have resulted in either close wins or absolute defeats. There are a load of different characters with a fantastic variety of powers and skill sets, which will give you a lot of team combinations to try out. And the devices are really neat and feel powerful and useful. How you use these is really integral to a good winning strategy. The best thing about this game is how it lovingly plays on classic sci-fi tropes. Thematically, everything clicks. However, the variable setup is a dual-edged sword. It allows you to configure the map any way you want, but it also makes it difficult to figure out what's a good setup without a lot of plays. Compared to the original game, Dangerous Planet offers a wider decision space and deeper tactics, but at the cost of it being less easy to learn and in a less iconic setting. 
And for a very different take on hostile aliens, check out Nemesis, Dangerous Planet. It's a public planet, a planet. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Dawn of the Zeds in about three minutes. While Dawn of the Zeds can be played cooperatively or competitively, we're only looking at the solo mode. It's technically a game for up to four players, playing time is long, and it's a pretty damn complex game. Farmingdale is a nice town, a good town full of decent, hard-working folk. It's supposed to be a good and ordered place, not a rallying point for four different herds of zombies who've developed a taste for Farmingdale flesh. Can you rally the town's defences in time, or will you let everyone die? You win the game if you manage to survive until the event deck runs out. You lose if any Zeds make it into the town square, or if there is too much chaos on the board. Dice. Dice play a huge part in this game. Rolling high is always good. Player turn. The core of the game is turning over an event card and working through each step on it. First up is 4R, which is most frequently used to move refugees to safety. Next we test for infection. If we roll lower than our infection score, draw a fate card and place a new Z unit on the matching track. Then resolve the rest of the fate card's effects. If this track ever reaches the end, it automatically triggers and a super Z spawns instead. Then we check to see if supplies are consumed. Running out of those will damage your units. Then the Zs move based on what tracks are shown on the card. The highway track is empty, so we place a new Z at the start of the track. The forest track has a Z unit on it and it attempts to move into an area that our civilians are defending. We compare combat strengths using this table. They're even, but the terrain shifts the result one step in our favor. We then roll terribly, taking three wounds and being forced to retreat. This area is now Z controlled and in chaos and the infection rate increases due to the hand-to-hand -hand combat. This was also an easy fight. Zeds can pair up and combine strengths. We have one action from the card and one player action. Captain Piazza is in a position to make a long range gunfire attack on the Zed breakthrough. We check a range strength and roll well, inflicting three wounds on the Zed, which flips it over. We fire again and roll well and defeat it. But this took both our actions and half our stockpiled ammo. Other actions include foraging to get more supplies and ammo, moving a unit a number of areas equal to its speed, noting that chaos stops movement, spending supplies to build barricades, which grants strong defensive bonuses. Researching by spending supplies and rolling dice, hoping to eventually develop a cure or a super weapon. And we can slowly heal units that have been damaged. Finally, remove chaos from areas you have recaptured and flip a new card over. Why would you like this game? Dawn of the Zeds has five difficulty levels ranging from reasonably hard to massively hard. And being able to change the game's difficulty and complexity is really good. But each and every level is a challenge in its own. And there's a huge variety of heroes and heroic civilians to choose from, meaning you can try out different strategies, tactics, and combinations. There are a lot of event and fate cards, meaning you will not see the same combination each and every time you play. And the higher difficulty levels add in a fifth track for added complexity and even more headaches. The best thing about the game is the narrative it creates. The combination of events, fake cards, heroes and dice rolls generates a lot of memorable moments. However, setup takes a while, especially sorting out all the tokens and the event deck. And some tokens have very, very specific uses, like this one here. And the game is just flat out merciless. It's hard to describe how quickly things can go from being manageable to utter chaos in a very short space of time. Oh, and it has five freaking rule books. Like the theme but want a stronger cooperative experience? Try Dead of Winter. And for something much, much simpler, try Castle Panic. Dawn of the Zeds, the good kind of mean. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Dice Hospital in about three minutes with expansions to follow. Review copy and deluxe edition used. It has a solo mode. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. You are running a public hospital focused on good care and outcomes for its patients. From the ambulance to the discharge lounge, you will manage your patients, all while expanding your services and staff of specialists. Can you run the most efficient hospital? The game lasts for eight rounds, and the winner is the player with the most points at that time. You gain points for successfully treating patients. Dice. Unsurprisingly, Dice Hospital is all about dice. Engine building. Using upgrades that work together well is key. Drafting. Each turn you will draft dice and upgrades. Player turn. Each player starts the game with a hospital, three nurse meeples, and three random patient dice, set to three, four, and five value. You also have an administrator special card. There is one more ambulance than the number of players. Roll three dice for each ambulance, 
re-rolling ones and sixes. Place the dice in order from lowest to highest in the ambulances, with the first player deciding ties. Each player then selects an ambulance and takes it. This determines your player order for the next phase as well. The current first player cannot select the first ambulance. Take the dice and place them in your hospital. You only have 12 spaces, so if your hospital is full, some patients will go to the morgue. This will cost you points. Next in turn order, each player selects either a room upgrade or a specialist. Each specialist comes with a worker meeple. Place upgraded rooms into your hospital and any specialists beside it. Next is the action phase. Here you can use each room in your hospital once. Each room requires a worker, in most cases one meeple. We activate Oncology. This lets us add one pip to a single yellow die. We choose the six yellow. If a six is increased, it moves to the discharge lounge. Next we use our specialist. Normally this room lets us increase one, three or four by one pip. But because we are using the microbiologist, we can repeat that on another green die. Dice that have been healed this turn move down to the bottom of the ward. We then use our allergy ward, which lets us increase the value of three of the same numbered green dice. Finally, we use the clinic to boost the green six, sending it to the discharge lounge. All dice that were not treated this turn are reduced by one pip. A die reduced to zero goes to the morgue. We then lose points for dice in the morgue and gain them for dice in the discharge lounge. Why would you like this game? Dice Hospital is a very straightforward dice drafting and manipulation game that isn't bogged down by a lot of complex rules and overheads. As a result, it's a game that can be easily taught and understood by people. The many ways you can manipulate dice using the rooms and specialists means you will end up feeling quite clever when you chain together a whole lot of moves. And it also allows players to specialize and create their own hospital with its own unique character. And while this may seem like a lot of different powers to keep track of, a lot of them are just the same thing, but for different colored dice. It's a solid game that keeps its core gameplay loop very clean and smooth. The best thing about this game is the scoring system, because discharging more patients at the same time is more points. It adds a push your luck element to the game that I really enjoy. However, while there is some interaction between players in the drafting stages, most of what you do is manipulating dice on your own board. If you're looking for a game with high player interaction, this probably won't be a good fit. But wait, there's more! Before we wrap up, let's look at the four modules which are included in the deluxe version and the community care expansion. First up is Experimental Medicine. This is a pretty simple module that adds a new rooms and specialists that focus on more extreme forms of dice manipulation. This one is really easy to add in after one play and it just increases the engine building potential of the game. Next we have the city expansion which totally removes the previously explained draft mechanics. Instead you build a city in the middle of the board and populate it with dice. Any twos are given a special bonus token, which can be redeemed later. Each player chooses an entrance to the city and places their ambulance and paramedic there. The paramedic moves into an adjacent area and claims a die, repeating this process three times until the ambulance is full. Each player does this in turn order. The draft phase player order is determined by who has the lowest value dice in their ambulance. Another quirk of the system is that any dice left on the board degrade by one pip, and if they die, the negative points go to the players with the highest value ambulances. The city expansion adds a whole extra level to the game, but I'm not sure it's needed. It does seem like a lot more work to get to the same result as the core game, each player having three dice in their ambulance. Next we have the investments expansion, which adds these special rooms that anyone can access. When you activate one, you draw two tokens from the investment pile and choose one to keep. These tokens are added to rooms in your hospital. In this example, orthopedics already increases one yellow die by three pips. The bonus power means you can then target a yellow die valued one or two and increase it by two pips. You must resolve the top power first, so you couldn't use this room to heal a yellow die five steps in one action. Because investments lead to stronger healing powers in the hospital, the highest value ambulances get an extra die in rounds five through eight. There are also extra rooms and specialists that interact with this expansion. Investments does something similar to the experimental medicine expansion, but dials it up a whole step, dramatically increasing the variety of engines you can build. I highly recommend this one to people who want Dice Hospital to be a more complex and deeper engine building game. Finally, we have the maternity expansion. This one adds four maternity wards to each player's boards and includes pregnant patients and babies, represented by pink dice. Only one mother can be in any ward, and for each mother patient, roll the baby die and add a small four dice to the lower wards. Mothers and babies must be discharged together. The maternity expansion also comes with specialists in rooms, as well as a lot of pink dice for mothers and babies. This is a super solid expansion, and it doesn't add too much complexity, but changes the style of the game. It really exaggerates the push your luck elements of building up for a super strong discharge round. Lots of mums and babies going out together means lots of points. It also comes with its own investment room as well, if you want to play it with the investments expansion. For a great two-player dice drafting game, try Noctiluca. And if you want something puzzly for groups, try Sagrada, Dice Hospital, 
Simple core, lots of options. Got a Koto and welcome to Dinosaur Island in about three minutes. It has a solo mode. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is medium to long, and it's a moderately complex game. The boss said he spared no expense building this park. Frankly, he's lying. We don't have enough money and people to keep the fences maintained and sell burgers to these annoying tourists. And that's without the lab monkeys complaining that they need more DNA cold storage all the time. And there's always something going wrong here. <coughs> Valued guests, there are velociraptors in the pool. Please clear the pool immediately and head to the emergency exit. Walk, don't run. Thank you. That's just another day on Dinosaur Island. The game ends when there is only one objective left to claim, and the winner is the player with the most points, which you get from many sources. Worker placement. You place workers and scientists in locations to gain the associated benefits. Tile placement. Your park gets full of dinosaur exhibits and attractions. Player turn. The game is played across four main phases, each represented by a different board. In phase one, each player has three scientists, valued one, two, and three. You alternate placing them on spots on the board. Here is where you get the different dinosaur types for your park. To make dinosaurs, you'll need DNA, and you get that from the amber dice. Place a scientist and gain the DNA matching the die times your scientist value. The black cubes represent the maximum amount of DNA you can hold, but you can increase that capacity using a scientist. Phase 2 is the market, and each player can buy up to two items here, paying their cost on the left. Items purchased are not replaced until the end of the turn. Specialists go here and grant ongoing bonuses. You may only have three at a time. Attractions go into your park in an empty space, and building up Upgrades go here, although you can build over existing structures as well. Phase 3 is where you use workers inside your facility. For example, we get free money here, and here we create a dinosaur. It costs one of each of these types of DNA, so we adjust our cold storage. We place the dinosaur in the park and increase our score, excitement, and threat level. The threat level is how dangerous our dinos are, and you don't want that higher than your security level, so we use a worker to increase our security. Phase 4 is letting people into the park. Here we have a developed park with a lot of dinos and an excitement rating of 11. So we pull 11 visitors out of the cloth bag. Three are hooligans and eight are tourists. The hooligans rush in and take spots in the park. We then fill the park with the remaining tourists, one per attraction space or dino. We then check security and threat, increasing the threat by each dot showing on the amber dice that were not picked in phase one. This is bad. The threat is five above our security. So five paying tourists are eaten, costing us one VP for each. Finally, we get one victory point or two coins for each survivor in the park and hooligans give you nothing. Why would you like this game? Well the obvious thing to say is did you like Jurassic Park and did you want a board game of that? Because that's what Dinosaur Island is. Well it's that but in neon pink. But under the bright lights and colors and plastic dinos there is a decent engine building game here with a lot of levers to pull and paths to explore to tailor your company and your island. And while the four phases initially seem daunting and complex they set the game up to have a real natural flow. There's also plot twist cards you can include to shake up the game and keep it from getting stale. The best thing about this game is that it has short, medium, and long play modes with their own objectives. I wish more games would do this. However, Dinosaur Island is a table hog and it takes a while to set up, so the short game might only be worth it to teach the game in order to play another game afterwards. Dinosaur Island also looks heavier and deeper than it is, and there's not a lot of interaction between players. I think it needed ways to sabotage the competition. Like the theme but want to roll and write? Try Dino World, and for a similar complexity game, but with cute animals, try Everdell. Dinosaur Island needs more gold bloom. Kia ora koutou and welcome to June in about three minutes. Review copy used. There is no solo mode. It's a game for up to six players. Playing time is long. It's a pretty complex game. Arrakis, a bleak and barren world which should be a forgotten rock if not for one thing. It is the only place in the universe that the spice melange is found. The spice extends life, grants mental powers, and allows for safe interstellar travel. The entire empire depends on spice, and those who control the spice control everything. You win the game if you control enough strongholds at the end of the turn. Some factions also have unique victory conditions. Competitive and teams. Win alone or as part of an alliance. Variable player powers. Dune has simple rules, but almost all of them have exceptions. During this video, when a faction breaks a rule, their icon will appear on screen. Player turn. First reveal a storm card and move the storm marker that many regions, removing all units not in strongholds from the board. Any removed units go to the tanks. Then reveal a spice card. If it shows a sandworm, place one on the region shown on the discard pile and remove everything from that region. 
Players can then negotiate alliances after this phase. Draw until a region card is shown, then place spice in that region. Then deal treachery cards face down equal to the number of players whose hand of treachery cards is not full. These are bid on publicly one at a time, but the cards are not revealed. They contain weapons, defenses, special cards, and worthless junk. Players then recover units from the tanks. Some are free, and you can pay two spice for extras up to three. If all your leaders are in the tanks, you can buy one back for its rating in spice. Next, you ship and move, and you can only make one ship and one move. Shipping to a region costs two spice per unit, or one spice per unit if you ship to a stronghold. You can move any number of units to an adjacent region, or if you control one of the northern strongholds, you can use ornithopters to move three regions. Combat occurs when two players' units are in the same region. A region cannot have more than two players' units in it. Count your units. This is the maximum number you can bid on the battle wheel for combat strength. Note this is also the number of units you will lose if you win the battle. You must add a leader, and then you may add treachery cards. Let's compare here. The Fremen leader is protected by a shield, but the Harkonnen leader is not. Therefore, the Fremen win combat 9 to 4, and the Harkonnen lose everything committed. However, if the Harkonnen had the Fremen leader as a traitor, they would automatically win the battle, regardless of strengths and cards. Finally, each unit in a region with spice claims up to 3 each. Then check to see if anyone has won, it is now the next turn. Why would you like this game? Theme is not flavor text. Theme is when a game makes you feel like you are immersed and involved in a setting. And Dune absolutely nails its theme. It's a tense and brutal game where every action can have calamitous consequences. A badly timed trader can ruin everything and every battle is loaded with risk. Forces take forever to replenish and resources are scarce. So picking the perfect moment to act is an art form. And each faction is unique. For one example, the Atreides can see what the next spice card is, can peek at the treachery cards before bidding, and can ask a question about what cards an opponent will play in combat. The best thing about this game is the Bene Gesserit win condition. Make a secret prediction at the start of the game, and if it comes true, you win. An amazing concept. However, this is a great game design from 1978, and while the graphics have been updated, the core game remains rooted in that legacy. Modern games are normally a lot more forgiving. If you are not a fan of games where you can lose everything on one play, you will not enjoy Dune. Prefer fantasy settings? A Game of Thrones offers a similar experience, and for a different take on intrigue, try A War of Whispers. Dune. You can't fear fear, fear's the mind killer. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Imperial Spells and Steam in about three minutes. Review copy used, deluxe edition and expansion featured. It has a solo mode. It's a game for up to six players, playing time is long, and it's a pretty complex game. Welcome to the world of Indines, where you combine steamworks and spellcrafting to create a magical train company. Can you manage to build the best network, hire the right specialists, and weave the right spells onto your train in order to become the greatest transport company in the world? The game ends after one player collects the required number of delivery tiles. This is based on player count. It also ends if a player runs out of trains. The winner is the player with the most points and you score these from delivery tiles, goods delivered and the public goals. Network building. It's a train game so you build train networks. Set collection. You want to deliver sets of goods to cities who need them. Engine building. This game is all about interconnecting powers. Player turn. You start the game by placing some trains on the board. Anywhere you have a train is considered in your network, and all tiles adjacent to your network are network adjacent. You can have no more than three players' trains in one area. Your network can end up split up. In this case, all trains are still in your network. You also start the game with five mana and can gain more later. You start your turn by deciding to use specialists. You only start with the captain. The engineer and captain are flipped when used, but can be unflipped later. The survey is one use only, and the station master gives ongoing bonuses. Then you decide which main action to take, administer or move plus activate. When you administer, reflip your captain and engineer, reclaim any spent mana, and gain one spell card from the available tray and place it on your board. Each row must be filled up before you can place it in the next one. If you move plus activate, do the following. Move your pawn to the right. One space is free, two costs one mana, three costs three mana, and four spaces cost six mana. Then decide which spell cards to activate. One car is free, two costs one mana, and three would cost three mana. They can be activated in any order. Many cars allow you to place trains. This one lets you place in a network adjacent blue area. While this one costs one mana to use, but you can place in any network adjacent area of those three colors. You can also pay two mana to leap over other players' trains, three to leap over a city, and four to leap over a purple wasteland. Once your conductor reaches the end of the line, you can deliver. Take one of the deliver actions, including selecting a new specialist. Then choose a city you are network adjacent to, in this case red or green. Select any number of resources matching that city's 
increased demand from your network, even in spaces you share. And if one is available, take a demand tile from the city and place it on your board along with the resources you delivered. Then put your conductor back to the start. Why would you like this game? Imperial Spells and Steam isn't a regular train game, it's an engine building game with a huge decision space. Between deciding where to go, what to deliver, what spellcast to take, how quickly to move your conductor, and how to manage your mana, there is a laundry list of decisions each turn. So the game is tailor-made for people who love to keep a lot of variables in their head, and for those who love to experiment with different powers and abilities. And the deluxe version is just damn good looking as well. The expansion adds in metros, which go in the middle of the board, as well as two entirely new factions. And each faction is different in how it works. The best thing about this game is it's a wonderfully fresh take on a very tired genre. However, the board can get very busy as the game progresses, and there is a lot to keep track of. And there's a lot of icons to remember, and we found ourselves hitting the reference book to look up what each spell car and specialist did. For another offbeat train game, try Australia. And for another game in the world of Indines, try Argent the Consortium. Imperial. Ticket to ride. It's over 9,000! What? Gold medal game. Kia Koto and welcome to Four Gardens in about three minutes. Review copy used. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a reasonably simple game. In Four Gardens, you are trying to build amazing landscapes to honor the gods. But in order to do this, you will need to master the Pagoda Tower and how it generates resources. Can you build the best and most awe-inspiring garden? The game ends after any player builds a set number of landscape cards. For four players, that is eight cards. The winner is the player with the most points, and they come from the four god tracks and bonus tokens. Card management. Every action in the game uses these cards, and each card has multiple uses. Set collection. Each landscape card is part of a set known as a panorama. Collecting these sets is the key to victory. Player turn. You will start each turn with five cards in your hand. Each card has lots of information, what set it belongs to, and what position it is in that set, what score track it connects to, what actions you can take with it, and what it costs to turn into a landscape. Each turn you will take three actions, and there are four different actions you can choose, and you can repeat them. The first is to play a card in front of you with its information side up. You can only have three cards face up in front of you at any time. And you may not play two cards from the same position in the same set. You can collect resources by playing a card. Rotate the shown pagoda on the tower, and then collect the resources in the order shown on your card. Note you can only store four resources, and any excess are discarded. This action rotates the whole tower, and then collects from the bottom up, gaining these resources. The next action is to cart resources to cards. This can be done by discarding any card. Place the resources from your reserve onto any of the cards in front of you. You can also return resources to the supply. Any card completed flips over and becomes a landscape. The final action is to play a wild resource card to place a single resource on any face-up card. If that completes the card, flip it over. When a card is flipped, move your score marker one space right on the matching score track and one more place for every previously flipped card in that panorama. Wild cards can advance any track, so completing this would give you five scores. If you make it to the end of a track, instead of advancing, you can move everyone else back down that track. If you push a player off a track, they cannot come back on. Finally, if you complete a panorama, gain one of the bonus tokens, either victory points, wild resources to add to cards, or an extra place to store resources. Then redraw to five cards, choosing from either the face-up tableau or off the top of the deck. Keep playing until the set number of landscape cards is completed. Why would you like this game? Four Gardens is a game with a lovely pleasant looking veneer and ruthless cutthroat gameplay. It straddles the complexity gap between family friendly and hobby games quite well being appealing and simple enough to be inviting while having enough to keep you engaged. The art is lovely, and I really like how there's a variety of cards in the panoramas, so they aren't the same each time. The mechanic of turning the pagoda and picking resources causes a lot of interesting decisions. And the scoring system, where you can suppress other people on the score tracks, is brutally ruthless. The best thing about this game is the pagoda tower. It's not just for show, it's a cool mechanic in its own right. However, the Pagoda is a spatial puzzle that keeps moving, and that will mess with some people's heads. Four Gardens is also not widely available outside of Korea yet, but will be in early 2021. Aesthetically, it shares a lot in common with Takedo. And for another pleasant looking set collection game, try Parks. Four Gardens. An iron fist and a velvet gardening glove. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Gaia Project in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. The game has a solo mode, it is a game for 1-4 to four players. Playing time is long 
and it's pretty damn complex. Across the galaxy, many different species vie for interstellar control. But this is not a war, it is a race. A race to terraform worlds to your liking, to unlock advanced technological powers, and to form mighty federations of worlds. The winner is the player with the most points after six turns. You gain points by completing objectives, advancing tech trees, forming federations, and much more. Variable player powers. Each faction has different home worlds and different powers. Network building. Building sets of connected planets is key to winning. Player turn. Each round, a different action will grant you extra victory points as shown here. First of all, grab one of the round boosters. This is a special bonus you will get to use on your turn. Then get your income. This is determined by all empty spaces on your player board. There are three core resources, money, ore, and research. Ore and money are used for buildings, ore is used for terraforming, and research for technology. There is also power, which sits in three different bowls. When you get a power boost, you must first move power from area one to two, and only when that's full can you move from areas two to three. You can also burn a power to move another power from bowl two to three. Power in area three can be spent to area one to do a variety of power actions, like claiming to or here. The tech trees are important and determine a lot of your strengths in order how much it costs to terraform a planet, how far away you can terraform, how many QICs you get, which are special power-ups, how easily you can turn worlds into Gaia worlds, and income and research ability. You can move up one step on a tech track by spending for research. If you build a research building, you can also claim one tech upgrade and advance your marker up the matching track. If you pick one of the bottom three upgrades, you can advance on any track. You can only claim the top space or the advanced tech tile if you have a federation token to flip, and more on those later. Actions on the board include turning a transdim world into a Gaia world. This costs a lot of power and needs a Gaia former, but the power can come from any bowl. This power comes back to you next turn. You can build a mine on a world within range, paying its cost to terraform and the mine's cost. The cost to terraform is determined by your tech and the type of world, which is different for each faction. We can use the booster we picked up to extend our range and spend a QIC and the mine cost to build on a Gaia world. QICs can also extend your range, and we can upgrade a building, paying its new cost. When someone builds within two spaces of one of your buildings, you can spend victory points to boost power as well. Once you have enough planets under your control, you can spend power to form a federation. This grants you one of these federation tokens. Finally, return your used round booster and select another one. Why would you like this game? Gaia Project is a heavy game with a colossal decision space and so many options on what you can do each game. Balancing expansion versus income generation and upgrade Rating. Managing your power expenditure and figuring out what techs to go after are all massive decisions that will hurt your brain each and every time you play. There are seven different player colors and starting worlds, each with two factions with different strengths and weaknesses. This is a game for people who love engine building and long-term planning and decision making. The best thing about this game is sitting down to play and thinking, where the hell do I start? However, there's a lot going on in Gaia Project, and I mean a lot. This is not a game you can just casually pick up and play easily. It definitely rewards repeated plays and system mastery. A quick jolly party time game, it is not. Prefer fantasy? Try the precursor game, Terra Mystica. And for a more realistic setting, consider Space Corp. Gaia Project is a three minute board games, gold medal game. Kia ora koto, and welcome to Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, in about three minutes. Review copy used. You can play it solo, with two characters. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. You are the Jaws of the Lion, a mercenary party arriving at Gloomhaven in search of adventure. Here you will discover new locations and quests, train your skills, and try to defeat a tide of evil. You are all working together as a team, and you win by completing the scenario goal, which is different for each mission. You lose if your character takes too much damage, or if you run out of cards. Variable player powers. Each character has unique abilities. Card management. Cards have multiple effects, and they are also your character's stamina. Character development. As you play the campaign, you will get new powers. Player turn. Start by selecting one of the characters. Take their action cards, miniature, and modifier cards. For your first scenario, you will need the tutorial cards. Grab the scenario book and open it to the first page. Place all player heroes on the start spots and the monsters on theirs. And be sure to check the scenario goal. Each turn you'll select two cards to play. The number in the middle shows your place in the turn order. Select one of those numbers and then rank all players and monsters. When it is your turn, play the top 
of one card and the bottom of the other. And you can choose which order to do this in. We use the bottom of this card to move four spaces. And then the top of this card to make a strength two, range two attack against two targets. Draw a modifier card for the first target. We get a plus one, which adds to the two strength and does three damage. We check the monster's stat card. A white based vermling has five health, so it's still fighting. We then attack the tougher yellow based one with our second attack. We draw a minus one modifier, so only do one damage. Some effects in the game will give you advantage or disadvantage. For advantage, draw two cards and pick the best, and for disadvantage, it's the worst card. Next, the monsters act and follow the rules on their attack card. In this case, they will move their normal speed and make a basic attack. The elite draws a 2x modifier, which does four damage. We can either take that damage or lose cards. Either two from our discard pile or one from our hand, noting that if we run out of cards, we are defeated. The second vermling draws a curse, and that's a total miss. Later scenarios add in more rules and effects, including attacks at target large areas, cards which grant you elemental essences which can then be spent to power other cards, status effects like this one which adds curses to the monster deck, or this one which stops them from moving. There are also cards you must add to your lost pile once you use them, and other cards that have effects that take place over multiple turns. Why would you like this game? There are two distinct audiences for Jaws of the Lion, and I'll talk to them both. First is for people new to Gloomhaven, and this version is much better at teaching the basics of the game and not overwhelming new players. If you've wanted a dungeon crawling game that has an excellent combat system that requires requires you to make important decisions each turn, this game could be for you. The campaign will take you all over the city of Gloomhaven as you uncover new locations, and there's a wealth of monsters to fight and treasures to obtain. And each time you level up, you will have new abilities and cards to play with. For Gloomhaven veterans, you'll like it for the four new characters. They're just as interesting as the advanced ones in the original. And really, it's just more Gloomhaven. The best thing about this game is the cool bonus at level five. They're too awesome to spoil here. However, for Gloomhaven, Haven veterans, the tutorial will feel very skippable, and the game lacks the scale and scope of the original. Treat it more like a mini expansion. For new players, even with the tutorial, Gloomhaven is a pretty complex game. It might be a modern hero quest, but it's many, many times more involved. Want a dungeon crawl but hate fantasy? Try Imperial Assault. And for even more of this, get the original Gloomhaven, of course. Jaws of the Lion. Pretty daft name, pretty good game. Gold medal. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Hadrian's Wall in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. It has a solo mode. It's a game for 1 to 6 players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty complex game. It's 122 AD and Emperor Hadrian has finally had enough of the picks. He draws a line on the map and says, everything south of here is Rome. You're one of the generals in charge of building Hadrian's Wall, the northern barrier of the Roman Empire. Can you hold back the picks and claim the most glory and renown? The winner is the player with the highest score after six turns, and in the solo game, you are trying to get the highest score possible. Roll and write. No dice here, but you will take actions and mark them off tracks on a score sheet. Victory points. Points come from many sources, including personal goals. Player turn. The solo game has very few rules differences from the multiplayer game. First grab one of each sheet, then take one set of cards and you will play two each turn. Turn over one fake card. This will show what eight resources are available to each player. Deal two of your player cards. Choose one to keep for its resources and take them, and place the other one along your timeline. This is a bonus you can score at the end of the game. You also gain any resources or workers from areas marked on your sheet here. Black represents soldiers, teal builders, purple servants, yellow citizens, and grey raw resources. Actions require you to spend workers or resources, and then mark the space used on your sheet. Here we use a builder to mark one space on the fort, and a resource to mark one space on the wall. Because the wall space covers up a yellow meeple, we take a citizen to our supply. We play two servants to advance this track two steps, covering up the hammer and resource icon. We claim the resource and also increase our resource production. At game start, you can only build in this box. To open up this area, you need to build the medium granary. You also can't build your wall or sippy tracks past the fort track. This icon builds your cohorts, which are important for defending the wall. The other sheet has the five different citizens and their buildings. In general, they work the same way as each other. Place a citizen to advance the track and claim rewards. Once you have reached a certain level in a track, you can build the associated building, like the precinct here. Each set of buildings does different things. The market lets you collect trade goods for reputation, the theatres give you a variety of rewards, the temples grant piety and favours, the courthouse lets you recruit workers, and the scouts let you play Tetris for bonuses. In a multiplayer game, you can use any player's card for this. In solo, there will be two dummy cards for scouting and trade goods. Once all players are done, draw a number of fake cards as shown here based on your chosen difficulty. These match against each cohort. If the sum is less than your marks in that cohort, you hold 
pull back the picks and gain valor. For each one that gets through, you gain disdain. Disdain can be removed by bribes at the baths, or negated by diplomats or offerings at the temple. And disdain costs points at the end of the game. Why would you like this game? If you have enjoyed Roll and Rights in the past and ever thought, I wish there was much more to this, then this is the game for you. Hadrian's Wall is a beast of a Roll and Write. With so many different paths and options to choose from, you will initially be overwhelmed. And then it will click and you will see how all the interconnecting parts of this game work. The goal selection system forces you to change how you play each game as well, as different paths will be worth different points. And the game comes with 200 of each sheet in the box, which is heaps. The best thing about this game is its depth. This is one game you won't be solving after two plays. However, like most Roll and Write style games, this is a solo game that can be played in a group. If you do end up playing it multiplayer, there will be very limited player interaction. And there is a lot happening on the two sheets, so learning what all the different tracks do is a lot to take in. Don't expect to get it all on your first play. Hadrian's Wall shares some common traits with Fleet the Dice Game. And for another heavy game with similar concepts, try Paladins of the West Kingdom. Hadrian's Wall, a wall of options. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Hot Shots in about 3 minutes. It's a game for 1-4 to four players. It has a solo mode. Playing time is around 30 minutes. It's a pretty simple game. The forest is on fire and wildlife and homes are under immediate threat. You are the Hot Shots, a crack team of experienced firefighting experts deployed to contain the blaze. Can you work together to get the flames under control in time? You win if all fires on the board have been put out. You lose if your base camp is scorched or if any eight tiles on the board are scorched. Cooperative, your only enemy in this game is the fire. Dice, fighting fires uses custom dice. Push your luck. You can keep rolling to get better results, but if you fail, the fires get worse. Player turn. The board is made up of a lot of location tiles that can be arranged in any pattern. Each has a scorch rating on its left. One is the easiest to scorch and five is the hardest. Each tile also has six symbols on it. These match up with the six different sides of the dice. To put the fires out, you'll want to roll matching symbols. On your turn, you can move up to two hexes, but not through fires. To fight fires, roll the dice. You can keep dice that match the symbols on the tile and then choose to re-roll the others. As long as you get one success on the re-roll, you can stay with what you've rolled or roll again to try to get that perfect roll. But if you fail to get any successes, a flare up occurs and all your successful dice are discarded and a fire token is placed on the tile. The number of successes you roll and keep determines what impact you have on the fire, reducing it in size, claiming special tokens, and placing fire breaks. You can also reroll one failed attempt for having another firefighter on your tile and another for being near the lake. There are also vehicles that you can use for one-off powerful effects, like the helicopter's monsoon bucket. After your action, the fire reacts in different ways. Draw a fire card and resolve it. This one increases two fires on tiles with a scorch rating of five by one each. This one causes the fire to spread in the wind direction, but not over fire breaks. If a tile ever reaches its scorch value, remove all fire from it and flip it over. For each firefighter on the tile, lock one dice at base camp that you can't use until you reclaim it. After resolving the fire card, it is the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? Hot Shots is a fast paced co-op game with simple rules and a really strong theme. The push your luck dice system means firefighting isn't like Pandemic where you just remove cubes with an action. It makes each action feel tense and important. Playing it safe and just knocking the fire down one step is sometimes the best move. And the system of wind changes and the fire spreading really adds to the tension and sense of panic in the game. Few co-ops hit you as hard and fast at the start of the game and there isn't a gradual increase in the threat, it's there from turn 1. The bonus tokens are also unique, with each one having its own special ability, and a lot of the locations have their own quirks. Like the propane tanks here, you really don't want scorching. The best thing about this game is how it models cooperation. Fighting a fire without support is risky, teamwork makes it a lot easier. However, like most cooperative games, Hot Shots is prone to alpha gaming or quarterbacking. And in the initial few turns, the game can be disheartening as the fire starts very strong. Some players can lose their special abilities very early on as a result of this. Looking for another firefighting co-op? This time about house fires, try Flashpoint Fire Rescue. Or instead of buying a game, you could donate to your local volunteer fire service. Hot Shots. I put the fires out. You made them worse. Worse? Or better? Kia ora koutou and welcome to the Isle of Cats in about 3 minutes. There is a solo mode. It's for 1-4 to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty simple game. Oh no! Evil Lord Vash is coming to burn and pillage the Isle of Cats. What a horrible brute he is! 
We need to grab our baskets, lots of fish, and rescue as many cats as we can in time. But just how does one stack cats on a boat? Isle of Cats lasts for five full rounds when the evil pirate Vesh arrives. The winner is the player with the most points, and you get these by collecting treasures, sets of matching cats, and completing objectives. You lose points for having visible rats on the ship, and for each room that isn't fully covered. Drafting. Each turn you will draft cards to play. Tile placement. This game is all about stacking cats on a boat. Player turn. Draw four tiles for each player in the game and place them either side of the board. For each treasure token you draw, draw a replacement tile and place the treasure below the board. This is the number of tiles for four players. Then take seven cards from the main pile. Select two to keep and pass the rest to the next player. Repeat until you have kept seven cards. Cards do the following. Broken baskets let you catch a cat, but only if you have two of them. A full basket lets you catch a cat. Yellow cards let you take treasure tiles. Brown cards allow you to get special cats. Purple cards have special powers and blue cards are lessons, which are objectives that score you points and they can be both private or public. Each round you will have 20 fish to spend and each card you decide to keep costs you fish. This one for example costs 5. You do not have to keep every card. Take all your green cards and compare them to your opponents. The player with the most boots on their cards goes first this turn. Players alternate selecting cats until they pass. Selecting one of the cats costs the basket and 3 fish from the left side or five fish from the right side. The first tile you take can be placed anywhere on your ship, but subsequent tiles must be placed touching another. Oshak cats are odd shapes and they can be any color. Just show that by marking them with a cat. Treasure cards allow you to place treasure tokens, basic ones or the rare ones from the bag earlier. If you place a cat on a matching color rune on your board, immediately gain two treasure tokens. Keep playing until Vesh arrives. Why would you like this game? I Love Cats is both a silly idea and a wonderful game, and it will appeal to a wide variety of players of different ages and experience. Superficially, it's a fun cat placement game. But the metagame around lessons and how they evolve your scoring is really captivating and surprisingly deep. What Isle of Cats does so well is create an emergent puzzle that as you play shapes with your choices of cards, placements and lessons. It's a game that evolves in front of your eyes. The best thing about this game is the captivating nature of the puzzle it presents. Admit it, you've been watching the boat slowly fill up instead of listening to me talk right now. However, due to the evolving nature of the game, on your first play you will likely not quite grasp the lesson system and how the objectives evolved, as it's a little different. It's also not the easiest game to recover from if you make terrible placement decisions early on. For another evolving game about filling up limited space, try Tiny Towns. And if you want something even simpler, try King Domino. Isle of Cats, Piggy approved, and a gold medal game. Kia ora Koto and welcome to It's a Wonderful World in about three minutes. It has a solo mode. It's a game for one to five players, playing time is short, and it's a pretty simple game. It's the near future where you are the glorious leader of a new state. Can you build your nation strong, harness the people's will, research fabulous technologies, and discover ancient powers on your way to building the most wonderful state in the world? The game ends after four turns of play. The winner is the player with the most points. Victory points. Victory points come from many different sources. Set collection. The most points will come from collecting sets. Drafting. Each turn you will draft seven cards. Player turn. Each player will have a starting faction card. The A side is standard and the B side provides a variable setup. Don't mix A and B sides. Each turn starts with a draft. Get seven cards, choose one to keep and then pass six to the next player. Continue doing this until you have kept seven cards. On turns one and three, pass left, and on turns two and four, pass right. Once you have seven cards, you need to make some decisions. Let's look at a card closely. This is its victory point value, and this is its set type. This card costs three science to build as shown here, and will produce one ore for each factory symbol in your display. You can also discard it for one ore. Some cards grant you a bonus when you build them, shown here, while others have non-normal resource costs, like so. We now decide which cards to keep and build and which ones we discard for resources. We can either place those resources on our faction sheet or directly onto a card. If that card is completed, it is built and placed in your finished card area. We then go through five rounds of production in order, producing and building in sequence, starting with gray and ending at blue. We have five gray icons in our build line, so get five gray cubes. This allows us, along with the green cube, to build the nuclear plant with its three black production. This is important timing, as black is the next resource produced, and without the nuclear plant, we will produce nothing in this phase. We build the mega drill, which means we produce one blue later this turn, but because gray has already gone, 
that won't produce until next turn. The player who produced the most of a resource type gets the leader shown above. For science, that is a choice of either type. Leaders are worth one point by themselves, but their value can be increased. Finally, any five resources can be exchanged for a rare red cube. These are used on some rare buildings, but can also be used as a wild resource on any building. They are occasionally awarded for building cards. Keep playing until four turns are up. Why would you like this game? It's a Wonderful World crams a lot of decision making into its rather short playtime. And it's a game for people who want to play an engine builder, but don't want to spend hours doing it. It's also a pretty straightforward game to teach and learn, with only a few simple mechanics holding it together. But the simplicity of the core system sits over a massive stack of cards that enables you to make complex and varied engines. The theme is a little batshit weird. Building aircraft carriers to find the fountain of youth is both bizarre yet strangely memorable. The best thing about this game is how densely packed it is with good decisions. However, drafting is a very group dependent game system, and with some groups, this fast paced game can be brought to a standstill by one slow drafter. This game shares a lot in common with the popular Seven Wonders, and for a more complex engine builder, try terraforming Mars. It's a wonderful world. It's a wonderful game. A gold medal game. Kia ora koutou and welcome to New Frontiers in about three minutes. There is no solo mode. It's a game for one to five players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. Humanity has left the cradle of Earth and struck out into the stars. Now the various colonies of Earth are competing for resources, planets, and technology in order to become the premier power in the galaxy. The winner is the player with the most victory points when the game ends. The game ends when you build too many worlds or technologies, or the victory point or colonist supplies run out. Set collection. Some of the best points come from collecting sets. Action selection. Each turn you will select one action to take. Player turn. Each round of New Frontiers has one player selecting an action to take. All players then take that action, but the player selecting it gets a bonus. Yellow selects Explore, then Green Develop, Red Trade Consume, and Blue takes Send Diplomatic Envoys, which moves them to the top of the order for next turn. Once all players have had their selection, reset the tiles and start again. The Explore action lets you take seven world tiles. Select one to keep and then pass them on. The player who selected the action gets a second world once all other players are done. Explored worlds go here with their grey side showing. Develop allows you to buy one of the many tech tiles for one credit per number in the diamond. Place it in your display. The selecting player gets a discount. Settle allows you to take two colonists or to place those colonists on a world, flipping it over to its active side. Worlds of red riding must be conquered using military score equal to their rating. Military score can come from worlds and developments. Worlds with black riding cost money to colonize instead. If a world had a white circle surrounded by a colored ring, it is a windfall world and you place a matching trade good on that world when it is settled. Produce allows you to put one matching good on each normal world that does not have one. The selecting bonus allows you to place one good on one windfall world. Trade allows you to sell goods for money. Each type of good sells for a different amount. You can also use consume powers at this time to get victory points. Finally, the retreat into isolation action gives you two money, but no one else can take it. Why would you like this game? New Frontiers is a much quicker game than it initially looks, so it will be an ideal one for people who want a fast paced game full of decisions. It crams a lot of empire building into very little time. And there are so many ways to end the game that it never drags on too long. It comes with a lot of tech tokens, and many of these are double-sided, allowing you to change the variables and play each game. The presentation of the game is great, with one of the standouts being the wonderful looking world tiles. But the heart of the game is its action selection system, and if you enjoy making decisions that maximize your gain while hindering your opponents, you might enjoy New Frontiers. The best thing about this game is the ridiculous oversized trade cubes. They're totally overkill, and I love them for it. However, the military strategy is an obvious and easy way to win, and the counters to it require a good understanding of the game. This can lead to a game that has a bad first impression, as one strategy seems so much stronger than the others. And generally, if multiple players end up competing for the same sets and bonuses, both of them will lose out. Like the ideas here, but want something simpler? Try a race for the galaxy. And if you like dice, try a roll for the galaxy. New Frontiers. It's Puerto Rico in space! Kia ora koutou and welcome to On the Origin of Species in about three minutes. Review copy used. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. In 1831, the Beagle set out on the original five year mission to seek out new life forms. Its course took it around South America to Aotearoa, Australia, and Africa. But the most famous part of this journey was to the Galapagos Islands, where Darwin observed how different species had evolved in different regions. 
You are part of the crew of the Beagle on this auspicious journey. The game ends once the Beagle has finished its journey around the Galapagos. The winner is the player with the most points and these come from multiple sources including objective cards and discovered species. Tile placement. Species are tiles that are placed on the board. Set collection. End game points are scored on collected sets of books. Player turn. At the start of the game place the objective cards. Place an anchor marker as a reminder for when each one will trigger. The fourth and final objective is always in the last space. The board starts with three species tiles, with one green, one yellow, and one blue trait each. This is a non-starter species, and note it has two yellow traits on it. On each of your turns you will take one of two actions, discover a species, or place research cubes. Each player starts with eight of these cubes, and can place two a turn on different species. Mix out a bunch more research cubes, and look at the discover action. You can choose from the seven species on the sidebar, but the top three can only be picked if you have a map. We want to discover this species. It will give us two victory points, our choice of these two cards, a crew card, and advance the beagle one space. It requires us to expend two yellow and two green worth of research cubes from adjacent tiles. We place it here and use these cubes. Each cube off a tile counts as the traits on that tile, which is why we only need one off the yellow tile. We go to place this tile in this area, which only costs two yellow. We have to take them from an adjacent tile, so cannot use cubes on the double yellow tile. Some species will have wild traits on them, and these can come from any tile type. This tile is also a high level, so we can replace the existing species and take it into our hand to score points at the end of the game. Replace the chosen tile with another species from one of the spare stacks. Then reorder the tiles so they are ranked from highest to lowest in value. When the beagle advances to a scoring anchor, resolve the matching objective card immediately. The bonus cards come in four types. The three colored ones contain some tools and crew, but mostly books used for scoring at the end game. The other card type allows you to pick one of the three on display. These cards grant bonuses, such as being able to use cubes in any area for an action, granting bonus traits, making it easier to replace species, and unique crew bonuses. Why would you like this game? On the Origin of Species is a deceptively deep game with some really compelling gameplay that will have your brain churning as you contemplate what is essentially the choice between two basic actions. And it's the combination of simple choices with an evolving board state that is the real gameplay hook here. Where to put those two cubes to get the best return. There are multiple alternative goals for each stage and they change how you think about the game each play. And while the end game always focuses on the books you have collected, the different ways they are scored alters your decision making process. The theme is well executed and will appeal to both adults and children who are interested in science and education. The best thing about this game is the beagle moving through the board. It's a wonderfully visual device and serves both a gameplay and thematic purpose. However, not getting a map limits your options. And while I don't think it's a game breaker, it can be unfun to be the only player without one. And I wish the game shipped with more information on the voyage and the various species. For a different game about evolution, try Oceans. And for something a bit more wacky, try Darwin's Choice. On the origin of species, no, it's not about that beagle. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Raiders of Scythia in about three minutes. Review copy used. It has a solo mode using AI cards. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. You come from the land of the ice and snow. No wait, you don't. You come from Scythia, a vast land on the steppe populated by nomadic horse tribes. You are the leader of one of those tribes and are seeking to gain riches and fame by raiding Assyria, Persia, and Greece. Will you become the greatest of all Scythian raiders? The winner of this game is the player with the most points once all but two regions are raided or there are only two quests left on the board. Worker placement. Each turn you will place workers in locations to get the associated benefits. Card management. Cards in this game have multiple uses. Engine building. Throughout the game you will assemble a crew with different special powers. Player turn. Each player starts the game with a leader and one follower. Each follower can also have an eagle and a horse. There are seven types of resources. Cumus, provisions, and silver are obtained in the village. And livestock, wagons, equipment, and gold are obtained by raiding. There are two main actions, work and raid. If you work, place your worker in a free village space and claim the reward. For example, three silver from the silversmith. You then take one of the other workers from the board claiming that benefit. In this case, playing a card's special ability or using your leader's ability. Raiding is a whole different thing. You'll need a warband and provisions to go raiding. Your raid strength is equal to the total of these numbers, in this case six. We want to raid this place in Assyria. It requires we use a blue or grey worker, have three members in our warband and spend four provisions. We then roll the dice shown here as well as one yellow die per region with gold. We get lucky and roll seven and two wounds. 
we add the 7 to our raid strength for a total of 13. Now we could claim the 2 victory points here, but we spend 3 Kumis in order to take our total up to 16 and claim the 4 VPs instead. We then assign wounds to our crew, because the Gravedigger took more wounds than their raid strength, they are eliminated, but both the Conspirator and Gravedigger's card powers take effect. Finally, we take the resources off the area of our choice and the worker above it, and turn the quest token over so it's available. Let's go back to the village. The farm gets you provisions and wagons for raiding. The market is where you can sell cards. The meeting tent lets you get cards and cumus. The barracks is where you recruit cards to your crew and heal wounds. The stables lets you get eagles and horses. And the chief's tent lets you get provisions and complete missions for victory points. Why would you like this game? The elephant in the room here is Raiders of the North Sea, but I'll deal with that last. On its own merits, Raiders of Scythia is a well-tuned game where you build up your warband with measured moves and then take explosive and dramatic raid actions. And how you manage and time your raids is intriguing and the crux of what makes this a compelling game. If you love multi-use cards and engine building, there's plenty of options to explore here as well. The best thing about this game is the place one worker, take one worker mechanic. It's just a classic. However, if if you are looking for the Maiko, he is nowhere to be found. There is a new art style, and compared to Raiders of the North Sea, it's leaner and meaner, taking out some of the systems I never cared much for like Valkyries and armor, and replacing them with wounds, variable leader powers, and animal upgrades. I think it's superior in practically every way to the original game but it doesn't have all the expansion content. So if your perfect game of North Sea includes Fields of Fame and Hall of Heroes, you might find Scythia lacking in options. Raiders of Scythia, like North Sea, only Pythia. Kia ora koto and welcome to Rival Restaurants in about three minutes. Review copy used. It has no solo mode. It's a game for four to eight players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. Eight rival restaurants have opened in one small town, and you are the chef behind one of them. So grab your kitchen knives, preheat your ovens, and fire up the grill, and get ready for the Thunderdome experience that is shopping for ingredients. Eight chefs enter, one chef leaves. The wiener of this game is the first restaurant to get 20 social media likes for their food. Set collection. To make and sell food, you need the right ingredients. Variable player powers. Each chef has game-changing powers they can use. Trading. You can trade ingredients and money between restaurants during the timed phase. Player turn. At the start of the game, you will have a restaurant and a chef, along with their standee, as well as one of each type of recipe. At the start of the turn, collect money, and then you must decide where to go in secret using this handy dial. Select your ideal location, and then place the dial down to show when you're ready to go. All chefs reveal simultaneously, and then you place your chef. The recipes you have will influence where you go. We selected the fruit stand to get the beans and avocado. Once all chefs are placed, the short timed phase begins and trading opens. If you are the only chef at a location, you can buy the ingredient you are placed on as well as any others, including buying blind from the deck. If two chefs go to the same location, they each get to buy the ingredient they're standing on. And then it's first come, first served for the rest. If two chefs go for the same ingredient, they enter a bidding war until one of them relents. Some chef powers have a huge influence during this phase. For example, Love Handle stops anyone else buying from that location. You can also go to the counter, and this allows you to upgrade your restaurant, getting a basic cookbook, a gourmet cookbook, an improved stove to cook more than one dish at a time, or more income. You can also pause the time round in order to play an action card. These cards have powerful effects, like robbing another chef or stealing their ingredients. You can also buy new action cards and dispose of trash here. After the time phase, if you have all the ingredients you need, you can make a dish. You discard those ingredients, gain a number of likes as shown on the recipe, and more of it matches your restaurant type. Collect any rewards for increasing your score as well. Then collect the trash shown on the recipe. Finally, draw a replacement recipe unless you have the matching cookbook, in which case you draw four and choose one. It's now the next turn. Why would you like this game? Rival Restaurants is a game about complete bastard chefs who care about nothing other than their own personal culinary creations. And as a result, it's a fast-paced, frantic game full of ways you can screw each other over. It's tailor-made for large groups of extroverted people who love lots of interaction and silliness. And the different chefs all feel unique and interesting, with game-changing abilities. And the whole game is wonderfully illustrated and presented. It nails the silly chaos and confrontation of its theme exceptionally well. The best thing about this game is the action cards and the sheer levels of silliness they bring to the game. However, while this is a game for 4-8 to eight players, it thrives on interaction and is far 
far from its best at lower player counts. I think you need seven or eight players to get the best experience. And due to the first come first served approach to aspects in the game, timing can be a problem and lead to arguments. Like the idea of real time cooking, but not competition, try Kitchen Rush. And for a totally different type of real time panic, try XCOM. Rival restaurants, one table, eight Gordon Ramsays. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Roll for the Galaxy in about three minutes. There is no official solo mode. It's a game for two to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty simple game. Humanity has left the cradle of Earth and struck out into the stars. Now the various colonies of Earth are competing for resources, planets, and technology in order to become the premier power in the galaxy. The game ends once one player has built 12 tiles. All the bonus victory point tokens run out. The winner is the player with the most victory points, shown here and here. Action selection. You select one action to take each round, and not all actions will happen. Dice. There's so many different dice. Player turn. Each player starts with five white dice. Three go in your cup, and two into your citizenry for later use. You also get a double side faction token and a starting world. These will grant you bonuses and extra dice. You also draw two tiles. These are double sided. Select one triangle and one circle tile and place them ready to be built. Let's skip a turn. We have seven dice in our cup and roll them. We align the matching sides to the five different phases in the game. The green die is a wild card. On our turn we really want to build this world and that will cost us four dice. We only have one planet die here. However we can place any die here to select our action for the turn and it will count as a planet die. We can also reassign one die by spending another one here. And finally, the wild card can go anywhere. All players then reveal their selected action. In this case, only three different actions were selected. Any dice from the unselected actions go back in the cup. The five actions are Explore. You can either spend a die back to your citizenry for two money, or draw a double-sided tile and place it under one of your existing tiles. You can also discard existing tiles to redraw that number plus one. The develop action allows you to place dice on the triangle tiles. Once you have as many dice as it's cost, it goes into your empire. Dice can be stored on tiles between turns. The planet action works the same way, but for the round planet tiles. The produce action allows you to place dice on worlds for later use, and the ship action requires a trade good on a planet and a ship. Trading gets you money based on the world the good is traded off, or you can consume them for victory points. You get one VP if the colors don't match the world, two VP if one color does, and three VP if both do. Purple dice match all colors. All dice spent on actions go to your citizenry. You can then put one die in your cup for each money you spend, and you will always get one money at the end of your turn. Why would you like this game? If you love playing around with dice and trying to make the best decisions based on what you've rolled, you will likely enjoy Roll for the Galaxy. The dice have different probabilities on them, as shown here, so knowing which dice will deliver what results really informs your strategy. There are also a good number of starting factions and worlds which jumbled up make for a lot of different power combinations. And the huge number of tiles, each unique and with its own bonuses and double sided, makes for a game with a ton of replayability as you can build very different engines each game. The best thing about this game is the satisfying clattering sound of jingling the dice in your cup before you roll. Love it. However, apparently people cheat at this game, and there really isn't anything to stop people changing their dice behind the screen. I personally don't play with cheaters, but this is a comment I've been told a lot. And while the game is all about making the best decisions with what you've rolled, some people hate not being able to do exactly what they want to do each turn. This is the dice version of Race for the Galaxy, so if you hate dice, try that. And for the even more board gamey version of this, try New Frontiers. Roll for the Galaxy, a gold medal game, but let's look at its first expansion. Ambition is one of those expansions that adds more, without overcomplicating the game. First, it adds in two new dice types. Leaders are the black dice, and they replace one of your starting white dice, and orange are the entrepreneur dice. They add two new systems. The dollar sign icon means a die goes back in your cup when it's used, instead of to your citizenry. And the multi-face sides can be treated as either symbol. Goals are added to the game, and you randomly select six. Completing one of these will give you these bonus tokens, which can be spent as a wild die, or kept for victory points at the end of the game. But my favorite thing are the extra tiles. There's only five in the main pool, and these focus on the new dice. But the biggest change is to the starting tiles. There are seven new starter worlds to go with the nine from the original game, and a whopping 14 new faction tiles. This dramatically increases the number of possible starting combinations. For me, this is what a good expansion should look like. Doesn't try to fix the game, it just adds more of the good stuff you like than the original. 
And it's one of those game expansions that just becomes part of the core game for me. Unfortunately, I haven't played the second expansion, so I can't give any comments on Roll for the Galaxy Rivalry yet. Finally, there's also an app version of this game on Steam that I have been playing the hell out of. And it's one of my favorite app adaptions of a board game to date. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any of the ambition stuff yet, but hopefully they bring that in sooner rather than later. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Sabotage in about three minutes. Review copy used. There's a solo mode using an app. It's a game for two or four players, playing time is medium, and it's a reasonably complex game. <laughs> the doom lasers are nearly charged and the world will pay for doubting me. The only thing that can stop me now is an untimely act of sabotage. Did you hear something? All right, let's move real quiet like. We can't alert the villains to our presence. Let's get to the doom lasers, set the charges, and get out. Each team consists of two characters. The villain team win if they can hit the spies five times. And the spy team wins if they can damage the doomsday machines eight times. Hidden movement. Each team conceals their actions from the other using the screen. Action programming. Each turn, you will pre-program your moves. Variable player powers. Each spy and villain has their own set of powers. Player turn. Each character has their own player board, with powers they've unlocked powers they can earn in game, dice they've unlocked, and dice they can earn. Start the turn by rolling your dice and assigning them to actions. For example, the generator action can only be taken for three or four. Place actions in the order you plan to take them. Once both teams have decided their actions, each player acts, starting with the villains going first and the spies next. Let's show some actions. Note that many actions say what you need to call out to your opponents, but some actions do not. Here we take this action to add a blue cube to the generator. Powering up generators is how the villains get more action dice. Villains get more powers by assigning dice to this row here to get the upgrade cubes from it. Next is a motion detector action. The villain declares the orange quadrant is what they are scanning. The spy players must declare how many spies are in that quadrant, in this case one. So the villains mark the board where they think the spy could be. The spies take a move and scan action, declaring the D to P column. The villains reveal they are located there, which grants the spy a point of swagger, which they can use to get power-ups and more dice. The other spy then declares a hack in the elevator, removing one of the doomsday cubes needed to win. They also play a hologram device Device to misdirect the villains. Next turn, the villains have a strong suspicion where one of the spies is, so declare a stun gun attack. This hits our spy and removes him from the board, but they can parachute back into the base next turn. Keep playing until one team wins. Why would you like this game? One of my all-time favorite computer games is No One Lives Forever 2. Due in part to its cartoonish 60s super spy look, and Sabotage has a similar wonderful aesthetic. Everything about the game's presentation is brilliant, and it's just an eye-catching game. The team play is also fascinatingly well done, and Sabotage loses a lot when you play it with two players instead of four, as the whispers and giggles behind the screen are a highlight. The hidden movement is excellent. With only 16 spaces, it seems like there's nowhere to hide for the spies, yet somehow it's just enough space for them to work. It also doesn't overstay its welcome, and rounds aren't quick enough to remain fun. And each character has its own player style and upgrade path, which can give the game extra wrinkles and quirks. The best thing about this game is the sense of tension you get when you are hiding from the villains, or the satisfaction of saying, FOUND YOU, when you locate a spy. However, Sabotage at times feels like it's stuck between a frivolous couples game with giggling behind the screen and an intensely competitive blind chess match, never quite settling on a true identity or tone. It's also incredibly annoying to teach people how to play due to the hidden movement, screen, and variable powers. If you like hidden movement in teams, but have lots of people, try Captain Soda. Now my second favorite thing with this name. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Sagrada in about three minutes. It has a solo mode. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty simple game. Stained glass windows are artistic works of great difficulty. You are an artisan attempting to make your masterpiece, but you are not alone. Other artisans are competing against you. Can you manage your supplies and tools and make the most wondrous stained glass window? You will mark the end of each round using a die. When 10 rounds are up, the game is over and the winner is the player with the most points. Points are scored by completing public goals as well as your individual private goal. Drafting. There are a central pool of dice that players alternate selecting from. Dice. Sagrada is all about the shiny bright dice. Player turn. Each player takes a window board, a secret objective, and two double-sided tile cards. Select one of the tile cards to keep and gain the number of tool tokens shown in the bottom right. Then slide the title card into the window board. There will be three public goals and three tools. Make sure to be familiar with them before you start drafting dice. Each turn revolves around the dice draft. Roll a number of dice equal to two times the number of players plus one. So for four players, this will be nine dice. 
Blue is the first player, so they select one of the dice. Play proceeds around the table to green. Green selects two dice and play reverses back around to blue. The leftover die is used to mark the turn. The first die you place must be on an edge, but from here there are restrictions on where you can place. A die of the same color or number cannot be placed above or beside, so these dice cannot be placed by the green three. If a square shows a number in it, only a die matching that number can be placed there, so the blue two can go on a two. A white space can have any die placed in it that does not break the previous rules, and only matching colored dice can be placed in colored squares. So using the rules above, only one die can be placed in the middle four space here, and that is a red four. We draft a red three, but this lets us use one of the available tool cards. We pay one tool token to use the card and change the three to a four. Subsequent uses of a tool card would use two charges. If you ever accidentally break the placing rules, you must remove those dice. Once 10 rounds are up, scoring takes place. You score the points shown on the bottom left of the goal for each time you achieve that goal. So in this example, we score it twice. Your private goal will always be the total value of one color. And finally, lose one point for each empty square. Why would you like this game? Sagrada is a puzzle game for people who love spatial puzzles and the rising tension of having your available placement options get more and more limited as the game goes on. And that's the best part of Sagrada, looking at the draft options and realizing that you have put yourself in a bad position or the triumph of getting a row exactly right to match a goal. The tool cards give you different options on how to manipulate the game and only three are included each time you play. And well, it's simply a pretty looking game. Those shiny dice are really nice. The best thing about this game is when it all works well and you have a wonderful looking, high scoring completed window. However, despite the myriad of tools, tiles and goals in the game, if you don't like the core gameplay of drafting and placement, none of the changes will make the game work for you. There's also limited interaction. While drafting to hurt other players can happen, you're far more likely to draft for your own needs first. Like the mechanics but wish the game had swords and spells? Try Roleplayer. And for a different type of pretty dice drafting game, try Noctiluca. Sagrada. One pretty puzzle. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Shaolia Warring States in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. Deluxe edition featured. There is no solo mode. It's a game for 2-4 to four players, playing time is short, and it's a pretty simple game. On the continent of Shaolia, a war has broken out between numerous fragmented states. You are one of these warlords trying to build up your state, defend your palace and your people, while promoting culture and education. Can you build and hold on to the greatest state in Shaolia? The victory conditions of the game are determined by the scenario. Normally you win by destroying your opponent's palace or gaining 18 culture. Card management. All buildings in this game are represented by cards. Dice. Allocating dice to buildings is the key to victory. Player turn. Each player has a board of 8 points possible build locations, two of which are locked out at the start of the game. You can pay three coins to remove these. Buildings can be placed in any spaces except defensive buildings which must be in the front row. You'll also gain a leader at the start of the game which is a powerful card you can use. The first phase of the game is purchase and you can pay one coin to get the top basic blue card or discard three basic cards to get one of the face up advanced cards, replacing it immediately. Officers can be purchased for one mineral and an extra die can be purchased for four coins. You may only make a total of four purchases each turn. Next is the building phase. Each building has a cost in its top right which must be paid. Buildings are placed on your board in an available spot. Some buildings like the theatre have a prerequisite, in this case a school. You can also choose to build those buildings over the building that grants the prerequisite. The final phase is the action phase and you get three dice unless you purchased an extra one. To activate a building, place a matching die on it. For the theatre we gain culture. The any spaces here can use any dice and immediately grant the shown bonus. In this case, two officers. This area needs both a six and a one to activate. We have a two, but we spend an officer to adjust the die one step to a one. Some cards like the infantry here do damage to opponent's buildings. You can choose to take that damage on defensive buildings instead. If a building takes its health and damage, it is destroyed. Trade buildings let you use the trade market. For example, we sell one mineral here for three coins. Six of these slots are static and the other two change. This one grants any tokens which can be used as any dice value. Finally, there are status tokens. This one allows a unit to do more damage. This one grants buildings extra health and this one prevents a building from working. A building may only hold two status tokens. Keep playing until someone wins. Why would you like this game? 
Shalia is a dice placement game with a high degree of interaction between players. It mixes engine building and dice manipulation with some old school burning down of your opponent's resources. It's most suited to two players as the game is built around a dueling focus. You attack your opponent while defending in turn. The limited spaces in your state lead to important decisions about what to build, what to defend, and how you focus on winning. And you'll always feel short of resources, which is a good thing. The advanced cards offer a lot of different ways to build and different tricks, but it's how you build combos in your state that is really decisive. The best thing about this game is the art style. I absolutely love it. Look at this guy. He's just happy to be here. However, each scenario has a different set of cards available and sorting those out each game is a bit of a chore. And ultimately, while it's fast and fun, I'm not sure if it's the deepest and most replayable game. Very serious gamers might burn out on it pretty quickly. Want a more complex dice placement game? Try Circadian's First Light. And for a less confrontational game, try Machikoro. Shalia Warring States. Machikoro for angry people. Koto and welcome to Shelfie Stacker in about three minutes. Prototype copy used. The game has a solo mode. It's for one to four players. Playing time is medium and it's a reasonably simple game. So you're new to the hobby and been looking around Instagram, Facebook and Twitter and you've seen those Kallax selfie shots of hundreds of games? You are one of the obsessive, trying to get the latest hotness to cram onto your shelf. Will you have the biggest and best collection or will your games end up on the shelf of shame? The winner is the player with the most points after seven rounds. Points are scored by having properly stocked shelves and from completing private and public goals. Drafting. Each turn you will select one of the available crates of dice. Dice. Dice represent games and come in four colors and are numbered one to six. Card management. Each player has a hand of eight cards and you will play one each turn. Player turn. Place a number of empty crates in the middle of the table equal to the number of players plus one. Then draw and roll three dice from the bag for each crate. You then choose one of your unplayed character cards and place it face down. Each player reveals their card simultaneously. The number in the top left of the card determines the turn order. In the case of a tie, check the letters in the bottom right corner. In this example, the green player will go first. In turn order, select one of the available boxes of games. You will then place those dice on your shelf. And let's talk about the rules for that. Dice must be placed at the bottom available space in a column. A die cannot be placed in a column that does not match its color. So purple dice must be placed on top of other purple ones. A die cannot be placed on a value equal or higher than itself. So this three cannot go on top of the four. However, a five could be placed there. Six is a wild and can be changed to any value. If you do not have a space to place a die, it goes on your shelf of shame, and this will lose you points at the end of the game. The cards you play can be used to alter dice. This one allows you to flip a die in the box over to its opposite side. So we change the blue five to a blue two and then place it on the shelf. Cards are tapped to show they have been used, but you do not need to use them on the turn they are played. This one allows us to treat this green three as a blue three for the purpose of stacking it this turn. If you are the first player to complete a public goal, you can claim that on your turn. Keep playing until the end of seven rounds. Why would you like this game? Shelfie Stacker is a dinky dice drafting game that is incredibly easy to teach and learn. The theme of having to properly stack a 5x5 Kallax with board games is one that many board gamers will identify with. Visually it's quite striking with a fun ensemble of character cards and of the 12 available characters you can configure the 8 you include in your starting hand in a variety of ways. But the real strength of the game is how the cards allow you to manipulate the dice and this is where it will appeal to more experienced gamers as being able to hold previously played cards back until you need them can lead to some interesting chain effects and interactions. The best thing about this game is the scoring aid. It's one of those genius ideas that keeps you focused on what you need to do and makes explaining the game so much easier. However, this is very much a lightweight puzzle game in the mold of Sagrada or Azul. If you are expecting anything more complex and involved, you will likely be disappointed. And mechanically, it isn't a revolution, but it combines a lot of popular systems into a solid game nonetheless. Like the idea of placing dice in patterns? You could try Sagrada. And if the drafting system appeals to you, take a look at Azul. Shelfie Stacker, here's our Shelfie. And if you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel. Makoto and welcome to Solar Storm in about three minutes. Review copy used. It has a solo mode. It's a game for one to four players. Playing time is short and it's a pretty simple game. Warning, warning, solar flare incoming. Oh no, the energy core has been knocked out of commission and we are drifting in space. No wait, we're drifting towards that star. If we don't get the engine core back online, we are going to roast to death. We have no time and so much to do. You all win if you manage to divert all power to the engine core 
and activate it. You all lose if part of the ship takes too much damage or the resource cards run out. Card management. Many actions in the game require you to spend cards. Automata. Your opponent in the game is the game itself. Player turn. The board consists of nine rooms. The engine core is in the middle with the other eight rooms arranged around the outside. Each room has repair markers, a special ability, and what it needs to have its power diverted. Each player gets three actions and you can take each action multiple times. Move allows you to go to an adjacent room but not diagonally. You can repair a room by spending a matching repair card. Place a repair cube on the matching spot on the room. Universal cards can repair any section. You can use a room special ability, shown below, as an action. If a room is fully repaired, you can divert its power by spending the three cards shown here. Again, universal cards count as any type. Place a diverted power marker in the room. A room with one of these markers is easier to repair as all cards count as universal to fix it. You can attempt to scavenge and roll a d6. On a 1 to 2 you get nothing. On a 3 to 5, 1 card and 6, 2 cards. These can either be from the two face-up cards or random draws from the deck. If you are in the same room, you can spend an action to trade cards with another player. And any actions you don't use can be saved for later turns. Some powers allow you to place protection markers in rooms. When all actions are done, draw either one card from the face-up options or two from the deck. Then damage the ship. Turn over the top damage card and remove the top repair cube from that room. Damage gets more intense as the game goes on. However, protection prevents a room from taking damage. It is now the next player's turn. Why would you like this game? Solar Storm is a small box game with a lot of game it. If you are a fan of solo or co-op games that are puzzle solving, you might get a kick out of it. The rules are simple, but there is a lot of ways to go about solving your problem. In particular, the room abilities and how you use them effectively are a huge boon. The graphic design is simplistic, but incredibly functional. It won't blow you away artistically, but it makes everything very easy to understand. Solar Storm is what I would consider a firefighting co-op like the games pictured here. You have limited time and resources to stop a problem, so if you like these games, you'll probably like Solar Storm. The best thing about this game is how much game comes in this tiny box. However, as much as I enjoyed the core gameplay loop, after four or five plays it was starting to feel samey. And while the foundations are strong, I'm not sure it's the sort of game that gets a lot of repeat plays. The deluxe version has different room layouts that might help that, and I feel those could have been in the core box. As mentioned earlier, Solar Storm shares a lot in common with the classic Pandemic, as well as the newer Horrified. Solar Storm, a little undercooked? Kia ora koutou and welcome to Space Base in about three minutes. There is no solo mode. It's a game for two to five players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty simple game. You are the Commodore in charge of a small fleet of ships. Your ships start defending your home sector, but as you expand your home fleet, you can send ships out to explore and engage. Can you assemble a great armada and get yourself promoted to admiral? The game ends after one player has reached 40 points, and the winner is the player with the most points. Points are gained by cards with the rocket symbol. Card management. Space Base has a lot of cards with different effects. Dice. Dice rolls determine which card effects will happen each turn. Player turn. Each player has three tracks on their board. Yellow represents money and tracks how much you can spend on new cards. Green is your income. At the end of your turn, if your yellow marker is below the green one, move it up to match. And the last track is your score track, which is advanced when you activate a card with the rocket symbol. Each ship card in your display has a number at the top right. This is the number which, when rolled, will activate the card. When it is your turn, you will roll two dice. The blue section of the card will resolve if you activate that card. So we place the seven here to get three coins. We could also choose to resolve the three and the four separately if we wanted to, gaining one coin from each. We then spend money to buy a card from one of the three displays. This one here costs four coins. It replaces the current card in the five area, which is turned over and tucked under the board, so the red part of the card is showing. Now in other players' turns, when they roll the two dice, you gain one coin whenever a five is rolled. If a double is rolled at any time, you can claim its benefits twice, so gaining two coins if someone else rolled a double five, or four coins if you rolled it on your turn. This means numbers one through six are likely to activate a lot more than higher numbers like 12, which only activates on a double six. There are also lots of different type of card effects. This one activates the card to its right. This one is charged up when you roll it, and that charge can be spent to take a special action. This one allows you to get bonus cards for free. This one activates either the card left or right, and the number 11 card here increases your income. Each of these cards can be upgraded and replaced and subsequently flipped over to their red side. Finally, you can also buy expensive colony cards, which give you lots of points. 
but these do not generate bonuses when rolled. Why would you like this game? Space Base is a fast paced fun game with a lot of interesting little puzzles built into it and it will appeal to a wide variety of people. Its simple core rules make it family and casual friendly, but the probabilities and card interactions will hook in many hobby players. And what will hook those hobby players are the special cards and all their different possibilities. There are tons of interesting combos and tricky plays that can be done with them. There's also plenty of decisions about what numbers to go after, whether to focus on money, income, points or specials. I also really dig that every single ship card has a unique name and unique art, even if it's just a different colour scheme. The best thing about this game is that everyone's always engaged. You get to do stuff on other players' turns and that's really good. However, some of the special cards aren't very clear about what they do initially, so you'll have to read up about them in the rulebook. This can slow down early games a fair bit. And well, it's a dice game, so people who always moan about dice rolls will probably moan about it. For a similar game with a real world setting, try Machi Koro. And for another space game about dice, try Roll for the Galaxy. Space Base. It's basically better Machi Koro. Kia ora koutou and welcome to Terra Mystica in about 3 minutes. There is no solo mode, it's a game for 1-4 to four players, playing time is long, and it's a pretty damn complex game. In the world of Terra Mystica, different races compete for land and dominance. Only by mastering terraforming magics can you transform the landscape to suit your people's needs. Will you build a great empire, or will you be stuck with a couple of huts in the mud? The winner of this game is the player with the most points after 6 full rounds of play. Points come from many sources, including completing round goals, and building towns. Just keep an eye open for this symbol. Variable player powers. Every race in Terra Mystica has unique powers as well as a preferred home terrain type. Network building. Building connected sets of buildings is the key to winning. Player turn. Each player will have their own board which has your buildings on it, your power bowls, your terrain guide and other information. At the start of a turn claim one of the boost tiles. This will give you a one-off bonus. There are four types of resource in this game. Priests, coins, workers and power. Collect income. This is based on what buildings you have moved off your player board. So here we gain 4 workers. If we had built 2 trading posts we would also gain 4 coins and 2 power. Building costs are printed on the board, for example this building costs 2 workers and 5 coins. Power sits in 3 bowls. This action says we gain 3 power. Because we still have power in bowl 1 we move 3 from there to bowl 2. This action gives us 4 power. So we move 2 to bowl 2 and then another 2 onto bowl 3. Anytime you can discard a power from bowl 2 to move move another to bowl 3. Power in bowl 3 can actually be spent to do cool stuff, like spending 4 power here to gain 7 coins. On your turn you will take actions, for example terraforming. For each race their home terrain is their player colour. To move terrain one type closer to theirs costs 3 workers each. You start only being able to terraform adjacent areas. This terrain starts 2 steps from yellow. Moving it to brown costs 3 workers, but this would be a terrible move for yellow as brown is right there, so they use a free spade for their booster to shift it another step to yellow. As it is now their home terrain they can build a basic building there paying its cost. You can also upgrade buildings paying the new buildings costs. If you ever have at least four buildings of sufficient size connected you gain a town tile which is a significant bonus. Dwellings give you workers, trading posts money and power, temples give you priests and blessings and the stronghold a unique bonus for each race. Priests can be used to increase how far you can terraform, how much it costs, and where you are on the cult tracks. These tracks are worth a lot of points and you can only reach the final step if you have a key from a town token. When you are done taking actions, return your booster tile and claim a new one. Why would you like this game? Terra Mystica is one of the classic heavyweight games and it's definitely for people who want something complex and challenging. There are so many levers to pull in the game from what cult upgrades you get to how you spend and gather power. And the different playstyles between the factions can be dramatically different. Different. The Darklings for example can only terraform with priests. This is a game for people who like hard fought games where you have to both plan ahead and be quick on your feet to react. The best thing about this game is how the board evolves through play as the terraforming takes place and how quickly you can be squeezed out. However a few missteps in this game and you are in for a terrible time. Running out of money and workers can leave you stranded while others surround you. Definitely a game that rewards experience. There's also an app version of the game but the AI is quite poor and the interface is quite clunky so it's best for online play and not solo play. While I really like Terra Mystica I gave a 
gold medal to its sibling game, Gaia Project, and I slightly preferred that one to this, largely due to the technology options in Gaia Project. Terra Mystica, Darklings are bullshit. Yo to Koto and welcome to the crew in about three minutes. It has no solo mode. It's a game for two to five players, playing time is short, and it's a pretty simple game. You are the crew of a spaceship on a long quest searching for Planet Nine. Through a series of 50 missions, you will advance closer to your destination, but there are always tasks that need to be done. Can you keep your crew together and find Planet Nine? In the crew, you all win by completing the mission goal. This varies from mission to mission, but most missions require that objective cards are won by specific players. You lose if an objective card is won by the wrong player. Trick taking. Each round of the game is called a trick, where each player plays one card with the highest matching card winning the trick. Secret information. You can only communicate limited information about your cards. Player turn. In the crew, there are four colored suits of cards numbered one through nine. There is also a special suit of rockets numbered one through four. Rockets are trump cards. Here's the basics of how to win a trick. The first player leads with a card, then each other player plays another card from that suit if they can, with the highest played card winning. Now in this example, the first player wants to win the gold one card. So they open with the gold eight. The second player adds the one gold to the trick and players three and four have no gold in their hand. So play other cards. The first player wins this trick because because they had the highest card of the leading suit. In our final example, the player on the right wants to win the pink six. The starting player leads with a pink eight, a very high card. The second player adds the pink six. The blue card cannot win, but because the right player has no pink cards in their hand, they can play a rocket to win the trick, because rockets are trump cards. To start the game, shuffle the cards and deal an even number to each player. Make sure they are face down. Then check the logbook to see what mission you're up to and follow the rules there. For our example, we will do a mission that requires four objective cards to be won. You may place one card in front of you to communicate information to the rest of the crew. If you place your communication token at the top of the card, it says that is your highest card of that color. If you place the communication token at the bottom, it says it is your lowest. If you do that for a high card, it indicates that you have at least two high cards in that set. And if you place it in the middle, it shows that it is your only card of that set. Each player claims an objective card in turn. The first player thinks their gold nine will help win the gold eight. The left and top players follow similar logic, and the right player aims to win the last card with a trump. You can also use the optional distress signal, which allows you to pass one card left or right before the round begins. Play until you complete your mission, then reset and move on to the next mission. Why would you like this game? The Crew is a game that will be popular with a lot of people, because it takes mechanics familiar to those who play Bridge, 500, Hearts, and other trick-taking games, but gives them a new lease on life. And that's the huge draw of The Crew. Trick-taking games are popular worldwide with people outside of hobby gaming. It's incredibly short playtime for each round makes it a perfect game for lunch times and for breaks between other games. And each of the 50 missions adds wrinkles to the gameplay, from having to do tricks in certain orders and sequences, through to weird little games like this one where one person cannot win a trick. It's also a small box game and very affordable. The best thing about this game is those tense round when there are only a few tricks left to play and you narrowly squeak in the win. However, to get the best out of the crew, you really need to obey the communication rules. Too much information makes this game too easy. And it isn't a rich thematic game. It's a great take on the trick-taking genre, but if you don't like co-ops or trick-taking, you probably won't enjoy it. For a more conventional trick-taking game, try Diamonds. And for a different type of space co-op, try The Captain is Dead. The Crew, the gold medal game that made me stop hating trick-taking. Rokoto and welcome to the Quacks of Quindlinburg in about three minutes. It's a game for two to four players, playing time's medium, and it's a reasonably simple game. In the German town of Quindlinburg, a group of charlatan doctors are competing to create the most impressive looking miracle cure. You're one of these medieval frauds or quacks. Can you con the local populace better than your scumbag rivals? The game ends after nine full rounds and the winner is the player with the most points. You mainly get points from making potions. Bag building. Players start with identical potion ingredients but add more throughout the game. Push your luck. Pulling more tokens from the bag will increase your score, but you run the risk of losing it all. Player turn. At the start of each turn, draw an event card. Some will affect all players equally, while others will require you to make a choice. The main focus of the game is making potions. Put all your ingredients into your cloth bag, and then draw them one at a time, resolving each one in full before drawing a new one. Each token that is drawn is placed a number of spaces equal to its value down the track. For example, 
This yellow four is placed four spaces along. You can use your flask to place a white ingredient back in the bag and draw again. Now, why would you do that? Well, if you ever have more than seven value of white ingredients in your potion, it will explode, immediately ending your turn. Some ingredients have a special effect when they are placed. Make sure to resolve that before continuing. You can also stop drawing from the bag whenever you want, unless you explode it, of course. Where you finish determines your score and income. Once all players are done, those with the highest rated potion roll the bonus die to get an extra reward such as victory points. You then resolve the purple, black and green ingredients in your potion and their bonuses. If your final space was marked with a gem, you claim one now. You then collect money and victory points, unless you exploded, in which case you get one or the other. You then buy one or two ingredients, paying the cost shown. They go into your bag along with all the ingredients pulled in the previous round. You can spend two gems to either advance your start marker one space or flip your flask back to available. From the second round onwards, each player other than the leader gets a boost. Count how many rats are between your score marker and the leader and advance your rat tail marker that many spaces. This is your new start position for the next round. Why would you like this game? Quacks is an incredibly family friendly, easy to teach game, but nonetheless has enough going on to engage more experienced gamers. The rat's tail mechanic is good for slowing down runaway leaders, and the game comes with four sets of ingredients, which allows you to shake things up. But Quacks lives and dies on the tension of worrying about the odds of what the next ingredient you pull from your bag will be. So if you like games that reward calculated risks, but will also just slap you in the face randomly, Quacks will be for you. The best thing about this game is the tension when all players are drawing from the bag simultaneously. It makes the game so much more exciting. However, Playing without simultaneous turns is allowed under the rules, and I personally think the game is a shadow of itself that way. It came alive when we did the draws together. Oh, and you can just have horrible, horrible luck. Like bag building, but want a solo game about real doctors? Try Healthy Heart Hospital. And for a different game about exploding potions, try Potion Explosion. The Quacks of Quinlinburg. Just one more. No! If you Kyoto Koto and welcome to the Reckoners in about three minutes. It has a solo mode. It's a game for one to six players, playing time is medium, and it's a moderately complex game. Superpowers are supposed to make people into heroes, right? Sure, some would become villains, but they would be challenged by Wonder Woman, Superman, or even Birdman. Not in this world. There are no superheroes. There are only epics, and Steelheart is the worst of them. Can you take him down before he kills everyone? You win if you manage to research Steelheart's weakness and then defeat him in combat. You fail if too many civilians are killed. Dice. This game is all about the special dice. Variable player powers. Each character has a skill and set of dice associated with them. Player turn. Each character starts with six dice. Three normal ones with one symbol on each side and three of their player color which have a double symbol on one side. You roll the dice up to three times saving at least one and more if you want to after each roll until all six dice are saved. During your turn when you use a die place it here. Once all players are rolled, actions take place, and it's important to note that players can act in any order they want, taking actions in between each other's actions and combining efforts. The main actions you can take are to spend any die to move from one zone to the next. Let's check this epic. Here's a research score of four and a health of six dash two. This means his health is six until his weakness is researched, then it becomes two. The purple action can be used to research and the green action to do health damage. If the epic's health is reduced to zero, remove them. Epics can be contained using the blue symbol. This reduces their action by one step per icon, making them less dangerous. The green, purple, and blue actions can all be taken on Steelheart as well. The red symbol is used to remove enforcers. Enforcers will make epics in their space stronger. The orange symbol gets you money, which can be used to buy equipment cards later in the round. And the black symbol grants you planning tokens, which next turn can be spent as any action. Once all dice are used, gain rewards for any epics defeated this round and buy equipment. Equipment gives bonuses, like this one adds an orange die to your pool, and this one allows you to convert one orange result into three purple. Then the epics act. Place new epics in any empty locations, and then take each action to the left of the bracket. These will most likely boost steel hard or kill civilians. Then move the bracket right one space plus one for each enforcer in the area. Steel heart then acts. Damaging civilians, hunting the Reckoner base, placing barricades to slow movement, and placing more enforcers. 
Finally, end the turn by moving Steelheart around the board. Why would you like this game? If you like dice games, co-ops, and games that can be scaled up in difficulty really easily, then The Reckoners could be for you. And while it's a stunningly presented game, it's the core gameplay of managing the special action dice and timing your moves that really makes it shine. The six characters map to the six special actions, so each character has a strength and you can understand their role immediately. The equipment cards can lead to some great combos and interactions, and the rogue gallery is both interesting and varied. And while I've not read the book series, one of my crew has and thought that the game was very, very true to it. The best thing about this game is that you can chain actions between players in a turn, truly working as a collaborative effort. However, The Reckoners is a table hog and guilty of what might be called overproduction. Also, like many cooperative games, a lot will depend on your group. Hide this game from that shouty person who loves telling you what to do each turn. In many ways, The Reckoners shares some DNA with Elder Sign and is an evolution of the ideas in that game. The Reckoners. Well, I reckon it's pretty damn good. Gold medal game. Kia ora koutou, and welcome to Tiny Towns in about 3 minutes. It has a solo mode. It's a game for 1-6 to six players, playing time is short, and it's a pretty simple game. In Tiny Towns, you are the mayor of a new township, one of many in the woods, and you are competing to create the best and most wonderful town of all. Can you manage your limited resources to build the very best tiny town? The game ends once all players cannot place any more resource cubes on their board. The winner is the player with the most points, with each empty space losing your points and buildings gaining them. Cube placement. Each turn you will place one resource somewhere on your player board. Victory points. Different buildings score different points in different combinations. Player turn. There are five types of resources in tiny towns. Wood, brown, wheat, yellow, brick, red, glass, teal, and stone gray. For each game, you will select buildings, and each building type is represented by a card and a piece type. Each building has a name, what resources it takes to build, and what bonuses it grants, if any. The six building types shown here have multiple alternatives, so make sure each player knows what each one does. The last two types are cottages, which are the same in every game, and unique buildings, which each player is dealt to privately at the start of the game. Each turn, one player is the master builder, and they are given the hammer piece. They call out one type of resource, and each player then places that resource on their board. The master builder changes each turn. Once you have placed resources matching the requirements of a building card, you can remove them and place that building in any of the spaces where the cubes were. These are all valid placement positions, but we choose the bottom left corner. Each player only gets one unique building marker, so if you place a unique building, you cannot place the other one. Some cards will only score points if they are fed. To feed a card, you must place a building like the granary, which feeds them. Some cards only score points or have effects that target adjacent buildings. In tiny towns, adjacent is only up and down or left to right, not diagonal. So the millstone is adjacent to the orange building, but not the yellow one. Placement of cubes can be in any orientation. So all of these placements are valid for building a cottage. Keep playing until you run out of spots to place. If you finish early, other players can continue playing until they are done. Finished players do not get to be the master builder again. Why would you like this game? Tiny Towns may look like a sweet and pleasant game, but it really isn't. It's a fast moving, interactive spatial puzzle where time and space runs out far faster than you want it to. And that's why it's the kind of game that will really appeal to people who want a fast puzzle that unfolds before them. A game where there are simple decisions each turn, but decisions with serious consequences. All actions in Tiny Towns are simultaneous, so playing with larger groups, the game still moves at a pretty good pace. And the variety of cards in the game mean it's not an easy one to solve. You can't just build eight cottages and two farms every game for big points. The best thing in this game is when you call out a cube as the master builder, and someone at the table curses you for it. However, it is really easy to make an early mistake in Tiny Towns and effectively eliminate yourself from contention. There's no way back from a bad decision. And that's really its biggest negative. Playing through a game where you know you are screwed is no fun. Like the idea but want something more tactile? Try Catacombs Cubes. And for a more involved cute city builder, try Everdell. Tiny Towns. Why did you pick the grey cube? Anything but the grey cube! So and welcome to Too Many Bones in about three minutes. Review copy used. It has a solo mode. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is long, and it's a pretty damn complex game. The evil tyrant has taken over, and the Gallic people live in terror, oppressed and persecuted within our own homeland. You're one of the Gallic Special Strike Force. 
your mission, infiltrate the Terrence base, and take them out. But the journey is long and hazardous, and time is against you. Can you save the Gallic people? You all win if the tyrant is defeated in the final battle. You all lose if you run out of time and have not defeated the tyrant. Narrative. This game has story encounters with decisions in them. Character development. Your unique character grows and develops new skills. Dice. This game is called Too Many Bones for a reason. Player turn. Choose a tyrant to face. This determines the length of the game, the monsters you will fight, and the final battle. Each player chooses one gear lock and takes their sheet and dice. You have four main stats. Health determines how much damage you can take and is shown with poker chips. You can improve your base stats as you progress, so adding two health here gives you two more chips. Attack determines how many attack dice you have access to, and defense does the same for defense dice. There are also skill dice you can pick up with training points. Dexterity, however, limits the total number of dice you can roll each turn out of your available options. Defense dice can be saved and reduce damage later on. Some dice can be saved for ongoing effects or used. Attack and defense dice can be reused later, but skill dice are exhausted when used. If you roll bones, you add them here and they can be spent to do special actions unique to your character. The game revolves around encounters. They will involve choices and some will involve fights. Fights normally have a number of batty points equal to the number of players times the number of encounters you've had so far. This is day two with four players we would pick eight points of baddies. They are placed biggest first onto the encounter board. Each has its own unique skills, health, and place in the initiative order. Place up to four baddies on the board, and only four can be in play at any time. The players then deploy and roll initiative, placing themselves in the order from fastest to slowest. Tantrum is first. He has five dexterity and four attack. He uses two dexterity to move two spaces and attacks with three dice, getting one bone and three damage. Three damage is enough to remove this baddie. The other players act, smashing the baddies, leaving only one left. It is programmed to attack the lowest health hero, so attacks Tantrum doing two damage. If Tantrum had defense dice, he could use those to reduce damage here. Keep fighting until all baddies are defeated or all gearlocks have no health. Then go to the next encounter. Why would you like this game? Chip Theory Games might have the mightiest production values of any company making board games. Everything feels so lush and amazing. The core of the game is a unique dice system and its interesting characters, and this is where too many bones shines. You each have a role and different strengths and weaknesses, but you also have variable development paths and options within your class, and it's this exploration and discovery of your character that makes too many bones engaging. The combats themselves are nice and short, and the whole game progresses quite swiftly. The best thing about this game is the genuine sense of progression and development you get. However, this is not a cheap game and it has lots of extra content, so consider Consider it carefully before jumping into it if money is tight. It's also quite intimidating to learn as each character has so much going on and each character is very different. And I also found the battles a little repetitive after a bunch of plays. For another game from Chip Theory Games, check out Cloudspire. Too many bones. My bones! My bones! My bones! My bones! My bones! My bones! That's too many bones! Kia ora koto and welcome to Tricarion in about 3 minutes. Review copy and collector's edition used. It has a solo mode, it's a game for 1-4 to four players, playing time is long and it's a very complex game. It's the 19th century and you are one of a number of new stage magicians looking to weave your magic on stage to the delight and awe of the crowd. Can you assemble the best support team, design the greatest tricks and put on the most amazing magic show ever? Tricarion lasts for 7 full rounds. The winner is the player with the most fame points at this time. The most common source of fame points is performing tricks. Action selection. You plan your actions each turn in secret. Worker placement. You place your workers in locations to take actions. Player turn. Each player starts with a board, their unique magician, their worker token and an apprentice, a hand of location cards, a starter trick with some components and trick markers, your choice of one specialist and some money. Roll and place the special dice for downtown locations. Then decide if you want to spend money to advertise to increase your fame. Secretly assign each of your workers to a location card from your hand. Each worker has different strengths. Three for your magician, two for specialists, and one for apprentices. Crystals can increase the strength by one at most locations. When you place a worker, it is modified by the value in the location. A magician on a plus two spot with a crystal is worth six action points. A lonely apprentice is worth one. You may only place at a free spot that matches your action card. Cost for actions are shown on the board. In downtown, you can collect money shown on a bank die, learn a trick, although advanced tricks require more fame, or hire extra crew. Whatever die you use, turn it to the X side. At the market, you can buy the four available components 
components, order new ones for next turn, or pay a premium to get a rush order. In the workshop, if you have the components needed, you can prepare a trick. Each trick costs a different amount to prepare and grants a marked amount of trick tokens. Only your magician may choose to perform in the theatre. There are four days, with Thursday going first but offering lower rewards, through to Sunday with bonus rewards. Each player can only place on one day. Workers placed on the back row of the theatre can place trick tokens on cards. Each trick has its type, shown here. You must place that symbol in one of the coloured areas on the performance. You can only place each trick on a performance once. If you place matching symbols, collect the bonus based on the tricks level and a crystal if one is shown. Other players can place tricks on a show. Then in day order, each player selects a show to perform. When a show is performed, each player gets their trick bonus. So red gets this. Green is the active player, so they get their trick bonuses, plus a bonus for each link in the show and the performer's bonus shown at the bottom. They also get a bonus for their workers in the theatre. Why would you like this game? Tricarian is a phenomenally deep and interconnected game that rewards repeat play and will be best suited to people who can juggle a lot of information. There is no straight path to victory and Tricarian rewards players who learn how to manage their limited resources and time. So if you are looking for a deep, rich and intense worker placement game, this could be for you. The collector's edition is also stunningly well presented with beautiful art and components and the magician's playbooks are some of the handiest reference guides I've seen in a game. It also has additional modules such as the Dark Alley, which adds bonus action cards and the Magician skill upgrades, meaning there are many levers you can pull to change the game. The best thing about this game is just how open the strategies are. Each game, I took a very different path. However, Tricarian is a super complex and long game, very much only for people who want a challenging heavyweight Euro game. And the Collector's Edition modules add complexity to an already complex game. If you try to play with all of them too early, you will be overwhelmed. Tricarian is made by the same people who made Anachrony. And for a different sort of magic game, try Argent the Consortium. Tricarian, go watch Tarakoto and welcome to Uboat in about three minutes. Review copy used. It has a solo mode if you're up for it. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is long, and it's an incredibly complex game. It's 1940 and World War II is underway. You are the crew of the U-boat in the German Navy, and your mission is to head into the Atlantic and sink as much shipping as you can while evading detection and returning home. You win this game if you complete your mission and survive. App. This game has an integrated app that is essential for play. Worker placement. Each action in the game requires crew to be in the right place to work. Player turn. There are four crew positions, each with their own responsibilities. The first officer controls the app. In here, you will select the mission you want to do. You will also manage a variety of tasks within the app, including assigning people to repairs, entering the ship's course and depth, and using the periscope. As well as the app, the first officer controls the blue figures, has to manage the event deck, and track the welfare and medical condition of the crew. They also have the Enigma codebook and visual identifications. The navigator takes the mission map and navigation tools, controls the green figures, and also the crew's dinner. Navigating uses the navigation disc. The first officer will give you your course and your contacts bearing course and distance. For example, set your course to 290. The contacts bearing is 42, and their course is 70. They are two nautical miles away, so you place your sub and the contact on the mini-map. Turning to course 350 would lead you on an intercept. The engineer controls the brown figures and the ship's depth and speed. They also monitor the ship's status in regards to damage and repairs and the tools and toolkits. If things get bad, they also have to solve a puzzle in real time to fix the ship. The captain controls the white figures and tracks actions and morale revealing morale cards when needed. They also have a hand of special orders. There are eight locations on the ship, each tied to different actions. Crew have to be in the right place to take orders. A contact has been located, so the captain orders a dive and attack. The crew mobilize to attack positions, getting off the top of the ship. The engineers dive the ship to 10 meters, and the hydrophone operator gets a contact. The navigator plots a course, and the helmsman change direction. The periscope is raised, and the torpedo tubes flooded. Finally, the targeting computer locks in a firing solution, and the torpedoes are launched. Why would you like this game? U-Boat is a unique game. It's definitely one for people who want a heavy game, a challenge, and a deep, rich, cooperative experience. Each player has a huge amount of responsibility and a lot to learn. So it's definitely for people who want a serious game that requires a time commitment to learn and play. The app integration is amazing, and there are many games around operating the anti-aircraft gun and the deck-mounted 88mm cannon. And the physical presence of the game is amazing. That U-Boat in the middle of the table sets the scene for the game like nothing else. The best thing about this game is the genuine sense of teamwork you get. When your plans come together, it's a mighty sense of achievement. However, being an U-boat crew in World War II and sinking civilian ships in the service of the Third Reich is not everyone's idea of a good time. 
and the complexity of this game is off the chain. For groups who enjoy it, it will be an absolute grail game, but it's exceedingly unfriendly to casual gamers. For a real-time cooperative game of less complexity, try XCOM, and for a less confrontational theme, try Kitchen Rush. Uboat, a serious game for serious people. Kyoto and welcome to Underwater Cities in about three minutes. It has a solo mode. It's a game for one to four players, playing time is long, and it's a pretty complex game. 71% of the Earth's surface is ocean, and it's 90% of the Earth's biosphere. Before we head to the moon or Mars, perhaps we should consider exploring our own planet first by building large, self-sustaining cities under the sea. Can you build the most comprehensive underwater complex? The game ends after 10 full rounds of play. The winner is the player with the most points at this time. Card management. You have to manage a hand of cards throughout the game. Worker placement. Each turn you will select one of the actions to take and gain its benefit. Victory points. Points come from many sources, including building cities with sets of supporting plants. Player turn. At the start of your turn, you discard down to three cards, and you will always have at least three cards at the start of your turn. Each turn, take one of your three markers and place it on a free action you want to take on the main board. You will also play a card to accompany that action. If the card matches the color of the action, you may use both effects. Otherwise, you just use the action and not the card. Cards come in five different types. Instant cards, which grant you an immediate power to use. Production cards, which produce resources in each of the production phases. Action cards, which you keep and can be activated when you take the action spot. Permanent cards, which grant you an ongoing bonus for the rest of the game and scoring cards for the game's end. There are five resources in the game. Money, Kelp, Plus Steel, Science, and Biomatter. Each player has their personal board, which has a starting city on it and three Metropolis tokens you can connect to during the game for bonuses. You will build cities and connect them to your network using tunnels, which can also be upgraded. You will also build supporting plants that will provide resources. Green for Kelp, Yellow for Money and Biomatter, and Grey for Plus Steel and Science. For each city, if you have one plant, it will provide these resources an upgraded plant, these resources, and if you have a pair of upgraded plants, these resources. You can only build on the dotted area here if a card specifically tells you that you can. But you can only build things if you take the appropriate actions and pay the resource costs. For example, this action allows a city build, this one allows two yellow plants to be built, and this one a tunnel. And this action allows you to spend up to three signs to upgrade three buildings. Actions with this symbol advance you on this track, grinding a bonus as well as changing the turn order for next round. There are also special cards which can be purchased with money which give powerful effects and in-game scoring. And you can always use this spot to discard a card and draw two more and get money. After three card plays, it is the end of the round, so reclaim all your workers. After turns 4, 7 and 10, you will produce at your plants and production cards, and also each error of play uses its own card deck. Why would you like this game? There's a lot to explain about Underwater Cities, but the core of the game is this. You all have 30 actions throughout the whole game, and you must make the absolute best of them to win. You will not always have the perfect card and perfect free action to take each turn, so figuring out how to make the best of a bad situation is absolutely critical, and this is who the game is for. People who love engine building and maximizing actions, but who also thrive on having to adapt their plans on the fly. Plus the game gives you an enormous sense of satisfaction when you build a huge sprawling underwater network. The best thing about this game is that you discard at the start of your turn. It speeds up the game and gives you the maximum time to consider your moves. More games should do this. However, you can tie yourself up in knots with this game trying to think of the best action. There is a lot happening and it can cause people to have analysis paralysis. It's also long and complex, so not for everyone. Definitely a heavy Euro game for people who like that sort of thing. For another tight action selection game, try Paladins of the West Kingdom. And for another game about card management and engine building, try Terraforming Mars. Underwater Cities, the best game I've played this year. Kia Koto and welcome to Viscounts of the West Kingdom in about three minutes. Prototype copy used. Part of our program to promote games from Aotearoa. It has a solo mode. It's a game for up to four players, playing time is medium, and it's a reasonably complex game. The Great Western Kingdom is in decline, and it is beginning to fracture. You're one of the Viscounts, a local ruler seeking to grow and expand their influence in this period of instability. Will you win the favor of the people, the faith, and the nobility? Or will you be crushed under the weight of your debts and criminal connections. The game ends when either the deed or debt cards run out. 
The winner is the player with the most points, as indicated by this symbol. And those points come from deeds, debts, buildings, manuscripts, and your workers in the castle. Deck building. You each start with a basic deck of cards that you can customize throughout the game. Player turn. There are four main actions, and they each have an associated skill and resource. Trade uses the money bag symbol and silver. Constructing buildings uses the hammer symbol and stone. Placing workers in the castle uses the fleur de lis and gold. And transcribing manuscripts uses the cross and ink wells. The criminal icon is wild and counts as any other symbol. Each turn you will shift existing cards to the right and play a new one to the left. The symbol on the three cards showing are your total strength for taking the matching action. Cards with the lightning bolt icon provide a benefit as soon as you play them. Cards with this icon provide an ongoing bonus and cards with the X icon give you a benefit when they go to the discard pile. Once you play your card, you must move your Viscount clockwise as many spaces as the cards cost. At an outside location, you can trade as shown on the map. Here we have four bags, so trade for two stone. We can also spend silver to supplement that. Also at outside locations, we can pay hammers and stone to place a building. Note this building gives us a permanent hammer upgrade, and each building boosts something unique. Place the building on an adjacent spot and claim the reward. If the building is adjacent to another one, claim the reward in the middle. At an inner location, you can claim a manuscript using crosses and inkwells equal to its cost. Also at an inner location, you can play fleur de lis and gold to place a number of workers as shown on this card into the castle. If you have three of your workers in one spot, one each move right, left, and up. Repeat until you no longer have three workers in any space. Bumping other people's workers off if more than three workers total are in an area. You can dismiss an adjacent worker by paying its silver cost to add its icons to your current action. And you can also pay its silver cost to recruit it to your discards. You gain the bonus power on the corner when you do either action. Some actions, like playing criminal cards, will shift your morality scores. When these tokens meet, a collision happens, and at the end of your turn, where they finish determines what reward you get and what other players get as well. Finally, redraw to your hand limit, it's now the next turn. Why would you like this game? Viscounts is a fascinating game that feels fresh and original. I've personally never played something that combines all these different mechanics quite so seamlessly. There are many ways to get points, such as controlling the center of the castle and the crazy mess that goes on there. And each player starts with a different unique character for their deck and different starting resources. And the the variety of characters you can recruit to your deck is huge. Combine all that with the building upgrades you can get and you have a game where the path to victory is very different each time. The best thing about this game is despite the many paths you can take, your main decision each turn is, which one of these three cards do I play? However, this game is tricky to teach as every part of the gameplay is interconnected. And when you first start playing, it can be quite overwhelming. And you simply cannot do everything in the game well. Not having a focus will lead to a frustrating play experience. Like this idea but love collecting cows? Consider Great Western Trail. Viscounts of the West Kingdom. It's a little bit different. Kia ora koutou and welcome to World of Tanks in about 3 minutes. Review copy used. There is no solo mode. It's a game for 2 players, playing time is medium, and it's a pretty simple game. It's World War II, the largest and most devastating war in human history. You are a tank commander in this conflict, leading a squadron of tanks into battle. Can you maneuver your forces into position and deliver a decisive blow to your opponents? The winner of this game is determined by what scenario you are playing. It can be eliminating the other player's tanks or capturing and holding objectives. Asymmetry. Each tank has different abilities, strengths, and weaknesses. Points. Each tank and upgrade has a points cost, and the game has a points limit. Dice. Conflict resolution in this game is decided by dice. Player turn. Before the game begins, you will take turns setting up the terrain and picking which side you will deploy on. The starter box comes with the four tanks shown here and is expandable. But in order to show you the full scale of the game, I will be using other models from the same manufacturer. The game is played on a three foot square. It comes with a measuring stick. Deploy all your tanks up to one length into the field of play. Each player rolls three dice for advantage. The winner is the player with the most critical symbols. Advantage means you win ties on this round. Movement is first, with the tanks with the lowest initiative moving first. A tank moves by placing the measuring stick against the tank and then replacing the tank so it is touching the stick flat. You can position the tank on any side as long as it's touching. Do this as many times as your tank's mobility score. Place a marker to show how many times you have moved. Next is the shooting phase and the tanks with the higher initiative shoot first. Tanks can shoot at anything on the board they can see. Woods and buildings block line of sight, so these two tanks cannot see each other. Woods, hills, walls, and buildings provide cover, and this tank is in the open. This Cromwell fires first, 
It has four firepower, so rolls four dice, getting a critical and two hits. The PZ-4 has one survivability, so it gets one defense die. Both tanks move two, therefore the defender gets four more defense dice. Finally, it loses one for being shot on the side. If it was in cover, it would gain one more. Defense dice cancel attacks. On a critical, the defender chooses what is canceled. The second tank fires, but it is stationary, so it gets to reroll all attack dice, getting two crits and two hits. The attack is at close range, so the defender loses one defense die. With only two defense die, they take one more damage and a critical. This does a total of four damage to the tank and it is destroyed. Some critical damage can be repaired at the end of each round. Keep playing until one player wins the scenario. Why would you like this game? World of Tanks is unlike most World War II miniature games. It's fast to play and easy to learn. The system itself is interesting and its focus on mobility for survival is intriguing. We only played it with medium tanks and I'm interested to see how the different tank classes and tank destroyers shake it up. The critical hits add a little bit of uncertainty to taking damage and can force you to change your approach, covering a tank while it repairs. There are tons of upgrades in the game, and this will lead to a lot of plotting and thinking about what makes up the best 200 point list. The best thing about this game is it's a historic miniatures war game that's easy to learn. These are rare. However, while this game is fun enough with the starter tanks, it really shines at the 200 point limit with squads of five or so tanks. So if you get into it, be prepared to get more than the starter box. These are the planned releases for the game. And of course, this is a game about a real war, which is a theme that won't appeal to everyone. This game uses the same models used in Flames of War. And if you like the ideas but want sci-fi, try X-Wing. Well to tanks. It's X-Wing, but tanks.